nation divided. A blue wave would equal a crime wave, and a red wave equals jobs and security. The president's not on the ballot, but he's made this election all about him. A vote for Steve is a vote for me. A vote for Cindy is a vote for me. A vote for David is a vote for me. Democrats fighting for control. Are you all ready to win this election and take this country into a far better direction? Their magic number, 23 seats to win back the House. An electrifying night and the chance to make history. The first results just moments away. Live from Democracy Plaza, the vote, America's future. On a Tuesday night in November of 2018, good evening from our election headquarters, live from 30 Rockefeller Plaza here in New York, renamed Democracy Plaza for the midterm elections. The first polls have closed moments ago. We are awaiting our first results, the first official referendum, really, of the Trump era. And President Trump himself, who may not be on the ballot tonight, but whose political future is very much on the line. Happy election. Happy election day, everybody. It is um, something I feel like we've been waiting for even longer than we usually wait for our elections. <laughs> but in part, it's because the, the early vote for this election was so huge and it started right Right off the bat, it feels like election night has been here for a few weeks already, uh, but now it really is. I'm Rachel Maddow here with Brian Williams. Uh, we have never seen this many races this close, not just in the House, but also marquee races in the Senate. Uh, tonight, some of the most exciting races and surprising results may also come from the governor's races, 36 governor's races tonight, including historic ones in Georgia and Florida. Uh, and, and we here at MSNBC, we all love sleep and family life as much as the next guy. Uh, but if there are enough too close to call races tonight, we may not know who controls Congress until the wee hours, uh, if then. This midterm election packs the punch of a presidential race. Over 38 million of our fellow citizens voted early in this. Whatever the outcome tonight, 2018 midterms may be remembered for images like this across the country. Americans starting early this morning, standing in long lines, some of them for hours to cast their vote. Here in the studio, we are joined by our panel. And in the field, of course, our road warriors have fanned out across this country, but you know what's coming next. That's right, we, as you do, we need to get right to MSNBC national political correspondent Steve Karnacki uh, for a look at where we are starting tonight. As Brian mentioned, we do have some polls closing already. Steve, I understand first results we're gonna get in tonight are from uh, the parts of Indiana and Kentucky that are in the Eastern time zone. Um, how soon are we gonna get some indication of how this night may go and how the big races are gonna go? I believe we just got our very first votes. We do. The very first votes of the night are now in in the critical sixth district of Kentucky, Republican held seat. Democrats are trying to pick this one up, and there you go, very scant. We've got 479 votes here. Andy Barr is the incumbent Republican here. Amy McGrath challenging. This is a district Donald Trump won 55 to 39 percent in 2016. Why are Democrats interested in this race? They're interested because you see the red. This is the rural part. You got some votes in in a very rural part of this district, small county, Menifee County. The Democrats are interested because this area around Lexington, about half the population in Lexington, in Frank. Frankfurt nearby, the types of voters who Democrats think are particularly motivated for them in the Trump era, younger voters, college educated voters, uh, white collar professionals, that sort of thing. You've got an abundance of them around Lexington. You've got some around Frankfurt. You also have Trump country in this district. It's sort of a mishmash of both. So this is going to be a test of that Democratic energy. It's going to be a test of the Democrats ability to make inroads into Trump country. It's also going to be a test of whether that Republican energy that was there for Trump two years ago is still there. So again, all we have right now, uh, this is a county uh, for what it's worth. I can, I can, in fact, I can tell you in 2016, this is a county Donald Trump won with 72% of the vote. The early returns we have here uh, show 57%. We're going to get probably about 2,000 votes here. So this is probably about 20% of the vote coming in in this county. If the Republicans are significantly under 60% uh, here, I think they'd be in trouble. We'll see where that, uh, where that lands. We're going to check right now. We've got a little bit more 
coming in. But we're going to check Indiana because the other big thing closing right now is the Senate race in Indiana. Let me go back and just see if we've got some returns there. This is a, uh, that's the wrong one. Sorry, I'm going to learn this before the end of the night. I promise you. Let's check in <laughs> in Indiana. Do we have any votes yet? We do not. So the other thing is there's a lot of early voting in Indiana. About 33% in 2016 of the entire vote in the state was early. So they tend to report that out fast. We'll start bringing that to you. Not the entire state is closed now, but a significant chunk of it. So again, any minute now, we're going to get a readout here in Indiana. As soon as we do, I'll let you know. But uh, Indiana and Kentucky 6 at this hour between 6 and 7, those, that's where all the action is here. A key House race, a key Senate race. Steve Karnacki, thank you very much. It's very exciting to have first votes on the board, even if there's only like four of them. Busiest man in show business. Yes, exactly. And it will be a busy night with Steve tonight. Um, we do have some exit polling data, and this is NBC News uh, national exit polling. We got a couple of big top lines, and I want to put these uh, to our panel, to our friends here in studio. Um, one of the first things that we have learned tonight is Trump job approval rating. Uh, according to the exit polls tonight, we've got Trump with a 44% approval rating. Uh, a 55% disapproval rating. Uh, within those numbers, we've got some finer lines, uh, including um, the president's strong disapproval rating at 47%. Uh, which is very high. We've also got uh, voters telling the exit pollsters that uh, the most important issue for them is not the most important issue that you see in every other election. It's always the economy. But look at this. Exit polls nationwide, they're saying that health care uh, is the most important issue. And the economy isn't second. The economy's third. So that tells you a few different things. Number one, it tells you that this election is happening in a good economy. Number two, it tells you that the Democrats were right when they said that health care was going to be the most important issue in this election. And it tells you that the Republicans were right, that they could elevate immigration to a place it almost never is in order to try to motivate their, boast, their base voters heading in. It also tells you that the, that the rap that the Democrats got for not having a message was wrong all along. It was sort of one of those things that in the national media sometimes we get wrong. The Democrats had a message. It was health care. They never blinked. They never strayed from it. And, and it looks like they got their message through. I think the evidence of that was about six weeks ago you saw Republicans lying about their positions on pre-existing conditions. Mm -hmm. So it's not surprising to see that big number uh, on health care. And it must be rewarding for the Democratic candidates who picked that and stuck with it. At the same time, though, seeing the immigration number pop above the economy yeah. um, has got to be seen as success by the president in particular and by the Republican Party that went along with him on this uh, really strongly anti-immigrant message. Well, you know, also, if we had a functioning government, and if we have one after this election, which would be ideal, if the government is split, all more, and more important than it be functioning, they will address the health care issue next year. Uh, the president will have to take the lead on pre-existing conditions. He's made claims that he's as good as the Democrats. He'll have to prove that. On immigration, another chance for accommoda accommodation by both parties. We shouldn't have to face these same two top issues two years from now. If our government works, if our Republican form of government works, they should address those two issues in a divided government. But Trump, so Trump sees immigration as the ultimate wedge issue. He sees right. immigration not as some, a policy issue that's designed to be solved. He sees it as right. a casting issue for picking villains. I agree. And for riling up the worst in people. And so, do you really think that Trump, no matter how I good the rest of the government is. I am offering a normative value here. <laughs> All right, Rachel, you know that word. That's a normative a value. Then. What I'd like to see yeah. is a government respond to the electorate. And if the electorate says health care is the number one issue, well, damn well, deal with the pre-existing issue. Come up with a, a modification of, of Obamacare that the Republicans can vote for and get 218 votes in the House and move it. And the same with the immigration. They had a really good comprehensive bill in 2013. 2013. Bring it up to the floor. Boehner wouldn't bring it up last time. Bring it up and pass it. I'm sorry, I'm a positive person about elections. Mm -hmm. They should lead to, we have engagement, time for the marriage. Okay, <laughs> a lot of people voting. Let's get married. Let's do something. Gene, when you look at those numbers, up, who's turning out what they care about? What are you seeing there? Well, I, I, I also see that Democrats did connect with the health care issue. I think that's the, the, the headline from that. Um, the, immigration is really interesting because we have a, a president who doesn't want to solve the immigration issue because he wouldn't have... He he, he, that's the wedge. He wouldn't have the wedge. So, um, so I can't be as optimistic as you are that anything is going to get done as long as Donald Trump is president on immigration. Um, I, what those numbers don't yet tell us is who connected with independents. And I think that's, mm -hmm. we're going to mm -hmm. talk 
a lot about that tonight. What, what they, you know, Democrats connected with their base and, and Republicans with their base, but there are a lot of independents out there. I, and that's what I'm saying. I mean, the, the immigration number to me isn't about whether or not it works. It, it says that Donald Trump drowned out every Republican candidate's message because the Republican candidates, they didn't lead Donald Trump to a message about immigration right. for the midterms. The midterm candidates running under the banners, Republicans, didn't choose to run on immigration. They followed Donald Trump there. The Democratic candidates running in these midterms chose to run on health care, and their surrogates, who are normal, like President Obama, former President Obama and Biden, followed them on their issues. So the difference on the immigration mm -hmm. issue is this was not something that Republicans running for Congress or running to, chose to run on. This was something Trump drowned out everything else. And, this, and that's, I mean, Trumpism within the Republican Party, right, is that I know best, exactly. you're all dumb, I can tell you how to do your and jobs better than you ever have. The, I pick immigration yes. for you. And it swamps out everything else. I mean, yeah. there, there's been some reporting in the last week that Paul Ryan pleaded with the White House, please let us talk about the economy, which doesn't stink for everybody. And, you know, no go. You, yeah, you, but then his PAC runs an anti-immigrant ad. Right. Because, because he so has to be no one can air it. Right. Meanwhile, good economy, it's issued like number three, way down. You know, <laughs> yeah. it just makes no sense. So before we're done tonight, this could turn out to be the election of pre-existing conditions. It could be the election <laughs> of new voters. Very much will be some sort of referendum on Donald Trump. One of the Western Senate races we're going to be waiting for into the evening is in Arizona. That's where correspondent Gotti Schwartz is waiting for us in Tempe tonight. Hey, Gotti. Hey, yeah, whoever said that the youth were not going to turn out for a midterm election did not come to ASU. Uh, you've got basically what's an impromptu party out here. You've got people giving out pizzas, ice cream. They're giving out water. There's a uh, DJ that's about to uh, start playing some music. And this is why. Over here, this is where uh, the voting is happening. This is the line going in. And I want to show you something that is jaw-dropping. We just talked to somebody that was here for 2016. They said during the presidential campaign, during the presidential election, uh, that right there was about where the line stopped. Now check this out. We're going to take a little walk here. Look at all these people that are voting in, in line here. Many of them have been waiting for over an hour. How long have you guys been waiting here? Uh, about an hour. Hour? Uh, yeah. yeah. Hour. We've heard people waiting as long as two hours. And the line just continues on. These are all young voters. That stretches all the way over there to new where those dorms are. The enthusiasm out here, extremely high. This is a, a state that usually does a lot of early voting. We know that the electorate has already turned out uh, about 75 to 80 percent here in Arizona. We know that about 41 percent of them are Republicans. We know that about 33, 34 percent of them are Democrats. But the majority of them are independent voters. And that's what we're seeing here. A lot of the independent voters that we've talked to, uh, they're fluctuating between uh, Martha McSally and her challenger, uh, uh, Kirsten Cinema, who has somewhat of a home field advantage here at ASU. She used to be a student here. She was also a professor. Uh, but a lot of these students say that this is the race that they're looking at, a Senate race. So we're on a college uh, campus, we're at a university, and this is how engaged uh, a lot of the youth are. Back to you guys. That's fantastic. Gotti, thank you for that. Speaking of the power of television, one of the chants during the Women's March, this is what democracy looks like. Yeah. That is what. And it was actually great work by the crew there and being able to see yep. from perspective so you could see how many people were in line yep. there. Uh, while we were talking to Gotti, we got a little bit more news out of the exit polls. Again, these are early NBC News national exit polls. And this number uh, sticks out to me. Look at this. According to the early NBC News exit polls, 16% of voters nationwide are first-time midterm voters, wow. people who have never, ever voted before in a midterm election. Among those voters, this is the Democrat-Republican split. 61% of them supporting a Democratic candidate, 36% of them supporting a Republican candidate. Now, 16% may sound like a sliver of the electorate, but turning out for the first time to vote in a midterm, that's the kind of, I mean, that, those are the people that Democrats are targeting. That is how the Democrats, if they're going to have a very good night, that's how they're going to do it, by changing the makeup of the electorate. That's how President Obama won. That's that when, when Democrats prevail in states like Georgia and battleground states like Florida, it's because they change, they, they turn out bigger parts of the Democratic coalition that typically just turns out in presidential right. years. And, and that was a, a figure yeah. that uh, Chuck Todd and, um, and um, uh, gave us when we first got the exit polls, 72% white, 28% non-white, the, the overall electorate according to those early exits. That's more like the 2008 election, mm -hmm. presidential election, mm -hmm. than subsequent elections. Yeah, and you know, it's, it's interesting too when you think about the anecdotal experience of voting in an election like this. If it's the 
the first time you've ever voted in a midterm election, either because you never voted before at all, or it's because you only think of ever voting in a presidential year. Turning out to vote this year for the first time, A, means you need to have been motivated. B, means you need to have figured out how to do it. Mm -hmm. And that's why the voter suppression story ends up being super important. If one party is counting on turning out people who are not used to voting in elections like this, who have never voted in an election like this before, the more barriers you can put in place, the more complicated you can make it, the longer and more arduous you can make the process, the more you can winnow down that number. You're so right, because there's a culture to voting. And once <laughs> you get into it, you're into it. You go to the community center, the local church. Young people don't go to those places. They go to the Starbucks, they go on campus, they're out in the street, they're all kinds of places they go, but it's an unusual step to go back to the old neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Well, in this case, it's great because you can vote on campus. That's mm -hmm. cool. I mean, I, I, I thought that I thought that re that report was fantastic. Yeah. I'm with Brian on that. That's, what That's the kind of thing does. we can do in this meeting. You can't do in the press and print press is show people doing it. I remember being with uh, Mandela in South Africa when they voted in '94. Mm -hmm. You actually yeah. saw voting happening for the first time, and it's, it's, it's thrilling. I was yeah. there for that election. That was an election. That was <laughs> we might see something right, yeah. but that yeah, was that an was election. election. <laughs> um, I'm keeping one eye on the man I affectionately call Coach K over in Coach's Corner tonight. <laughs> We're going to go to a break, and when we come back, we'll get an update on the numbers. Look at those little squares. Fill oh, there we go. Look at, look at, uh, that's all we're going to say. Few squares filled in on the map of Indiana. We are just getting underway. Please stay with us. Our live coverage continues after this. The outside view of our building, the vote 2018, the midterm elections, over to the board we go. Steve Kornacki, I have watched your map of Indiana populate with a few colors. What does it all mean? It's starting to fill up. So you see here, again, only about 20,000 votes, a little bit more in statewide. You see Braun, the Republican, out to the early lead. Look, it's Republican country that's coming in very slowly right now. Here's the interesting thing we can tell you about Indiana. Hillary Clinton got blown out in this state two years ago. The margin she lost by almost 20 points. She won four counties in, in this state two years ago. Now, Donnelly also managed to win this state six years ago when he ran for the U.S. Senate. So obviously we're going to see here how much is Donnelly improving off Hillary Clinton's numbers from two years ago and how close is he getting to the numbers that he posted when he won this state six years ago. So let's take you through to give you a sense of what we're seeing in these counties. So again, these are Republican counties coming in. Pulaski County, though, right here, you see the result right now early, a 55-42 margin for Braun. Now, when Donnelly he ran in one uh, in 2012. He got 44% of the vote in this county, so he's a little shy of that. But look how Hillary Clinton did here in 2016. He's 20 points north of what Hillary Clinton got here in 2016. Let's go to Miami County again, Republican territory. Look, he's eight points north of where Hillary Clinton finished. 21% for Clinton in 2016 tonight. Donnelly running at 29%. That is not where he finished though in, in uh, 20, uh, 2012. In 2012, he did manage to get 39% of the vote. Uh, in Miami County, but again, you see an improvement there. How about this one? This one might need some explanation. Whitley County, Republican territory, 62% in the early going for Donnelly. This was a 73% Trump uh, zone, so we're going to see as more vote comes in there. But this is the trend we're seeing in these Republican counties so far for Donnelly. We know he's going to be behind when you add these together. These are some of the strongest areas for Braun. But look, Hillary Clinton got 38% of the vote here uh, in 2016. There is a, an independent, a libertarian candidate who's going to get a couple points. So Donnelly needs to be running kind of about 10 points plus better than Hillary Clinton. So those early numbers you see, he's down statewide, but it certainly suggests a competitive race. We're going to see, though, the big thing for Democrats, when does Marion County, Indianapolis come in? When does Lake County, Gary come in? South Bend, St. Joseph County? And the wild card tonight, Southern Indiana. This is an area that swung hard to Donald Trump, but as recently as 2008 with Obama in 2012 with Donnelly, Democrats could compete and win counties down here. If you see any blue popping up in this southern part of Indiana tonight, that is a very encouraging sign for Democrats. Steve Karnacki, thank you very much. We're going to go now take a look at the race tonight in Tennessee. Uh, Tennessee Senator Bob Corker decided he did not want to stay in the Senate anymore. Uh, the race to replace him has been interesting. Marsha Blackburn, Congresswoman Marsha Blackburn running essentially as a very conservative Republican for that Senate seat against Phil Bredesen, the Democrat, uh, who's running as essentially a conservative Democrat, a moderate in that race. Uh, Chris Jansing is in Antioch, Tennessee, which is outside Nashville. Chris, what are you seeing tonight? 
Uh, incredible lines, uh, uh, something we have not seen uh, as we've been going around Tennessee. Take a look at this. Uh, people have been coming in after work. They wind around. They have a voter ID here. You have to show a photo ID. So first they have to do that. And then take a look at this line. It's been running, Rachel, one to two hours all day long. Uh, voters patiently waiting. When I talked to poll workers, they told me, frankly, nobody's been leaving. Maybe a handful of people. And then they asked how late the polls were going to be open and that they would come back. There is here a, a big change that has happened. This used to be a pretty rural area. Now it's suburban, one of the fastest growing areas of Tennessee. And key for Phil Bredesen, it's majority minority. And a lot of immigrants are here. I want to talk right now to Yolanda. People have been waiting in line so long, including <laughs> yes, you. Why wait so long? I'm just um, wanting my vote to count. I'm just more so concerned with the health care because I work in the health care field and I'm more so concerned with um, just the quality of, quality of life, of not just me, but um, senior citizens as well. I Are you settled on the Senate race? Yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah. um, Bredesen. Because well, for him, um, just health care issues and the constant appeal of Obamacare. Um, we deal with patients every day that don't have health care insurance. Um, luckily, our institution has um, other funding that's available to cover that de uh, deficiency with the patients. I'm um, just concerned with that, not only for them, but myself as well. I know we had somebody stand in line for her so she could come out. We're going to let her go back into line. Uh, but they are going to uh, keep this open as long as they can. Most importantly, maybe, uh, there have been lines like this, I am told, by the Bredesen campaign in both Memphis and Nashville. They're encouraging people to stay in line. Obviously, they need to win these kinds of districts if they're going to win this race. And um, the pizza has arrived. So some of these workers have been here uh, 10 hours now. So we're happy to know they're finally going to get fed, Rachel. Chris Jansing in Antioch, Tennessee. Chris, thank you very much for that. I got to say, seeing all, those, seeing all those people turning out, those young adults turning out, and Chris is saying that's been a one and two hour line all day long. And everybody's yep. there with their kids, yep. with their little kids and kids in strollers and babes in arms. And that is a... That's a lot to do, uh, and seeing people do that, knowing they're going to be there an hour or two, and people not leaving, it uh, it makes you feel good. It's I mean, another, it also it's frustrating, it's also, but it makes you feel good. It's also another voter voting on health care. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right, uh, we are waiting on news right now out of one of the tightest races in the nation and one of the most closely watched. It's the battle for governor in Georgia. The Democrat is Stacey Abrams, former Democratic leader in the legislature. The Republican is Brian Kemp, who has a dual-hatted role. He's also Secretary of State, which means he is running the election in which he is competing. Uh, this is a race that has had a lot of national news ups and downs. We'll be going to Georgia next. Stay with us. Welcome back as we cover the live vote coming in from this midterm election night 2018. And we are joined by a Democratic incumbent in the U.S. Senate, Amy Klobuchar of the state of Minnesota. Senator, for most generalist uh, viewers, uh, thank you for joining us first off. They are seeing you for the first time, perhaps uh, since the Kavanaugh hearings. And before we talk about the politics of tonight, I'm curious, have you been surprised to see how much traction the other party has gotten out of the Kavanaugh hearings every night, rally after rally. We hear the president's talking point that a good man was mistreated. Well, rallies are one thing, Brian, but votes are another. And it is true that they have been trying to play this issue out. But what I hear from Minnesotans is they want to talk about people getting kicked off their insurance for pre-existing conditions or the price of <coughs> prescription drugs. And as you've seen over time, the people of America has realized, whether they agreed or not, he got on the court. And for them to keep using this as an issue, I think you're seeing with independent voters, um, especially in a lot of our congressional district votes in Minnesota, this issue is not determinative. You could see it in your own exit polls. Senator, it's what struck me a, a couple weeks ago was how the Midwest is really in play this time. The states like Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan voted very narrowly for a total of like 70,000 votes in toto uh, for President Trump. This time around, it seems like the Midwest is moving into the Democratic column right across the board for governor, senator, and probably House as well. 
Well, we don't want to take anything for granted, but I am wearing my purple dress for a reason besides Prince and the Vikings. Um, and that this is the moment where the Midwest and a lot of our states uh, that, as you recognized, either voted for Trump or in Minnesota uh, barely did right. Hillary win. It's a change. These governor races. Um, I talked to our candidate, Fred Hubble, down in Iowa, and it is he's feeling good down there. You look at in Illinois, uh, you look at um, how well Tammy Baldwin is doing. I talked to her this morning over in Wisconsin and then these incredible congressional races uh, in the suburbs where I think we're going to take back two seats uh, in two congressional races in Minnesota, both currently held by Republicans. As we look at, I think our projections may be that two thirds of eligible voters may be voting in a midterm in Minnesota, despite flurries of snow. You know, I think this whole campaign tonight we're going to be covering here is in a Republican territory. It's an offensive for the Democrats because I can't think of, well, you can tell me this, do you know a single Democratic incumbent in the Senate or the House that's worried about re-election? Um, you'll have to talk to them, but I think what you, you know those numbers uh, where we have 35 Senate seats up and I think 22 of them um, are, are Democrats uh, that are running. I mean, those are extraordinarily difficult odds, and we right. know that going into it. But we have such great candidates like Claire McCaskill still fighting it out. Uh, Heidi, I just talked to her. Remember last time she held up the paper mm -hmm. that said her opponent won, and she won. Um, so I think we got to give these guys uh, tonight, and also we've got the House and then these governor's mm -hmm. races, and it is really all about turning out, but it's also about independent voters and what they think of the president's behavior over the last year. From the Twin Cities tonight, our thanks to Democratic Senator Amy Klobuchar of Minnesota. Thank you very much for making time to talk with it's us. Great to be Back to the board we go because I am told we have an update on Kentucky 6, though I see Indiana. We're, we're toggling between the two of them. Let me give you a little bit more coming in in Indiana. Now, what's going on here, as we said, about a third of the vote in Indiana is early vote. That's the first thing that comes in. Then you start getting more of the same day vote. So I think the county where we got the best read now uh, in, in terms of the most vote in right down here, this is Lawrence County. Now, again, you see Braun. This is a Republican county, 65-31 over Donnelly. The numbers we've been keeping in mind, when Donnelly won in 2012 in this county, he got 40% of the vote. So right now he's running under that. However, when Hillary Clinton got clobbered in Indiana two years ago, she got 22% here. So we also might be seeing a different vote distribution pattern sort of emerge here. Again, the benchmark for Donnelly, it'd be great for him if he's running at his 2012 level, certainly, but also if he's running consistently double digits, close to double digits ahead of Hillary Clinton, that would also put him in the game. Moving over to Indiana, to Indiana, to Kentucky 6, that congressional race we're watching at this hour, very early, but again, we can just show you a little bit what, what's happening here is the absentee ballots are coming in in these rural Trump counties. For example, this is a county where Donald Trump got 72% of the vote. Showed you a minute ago, he got 72% of the vote here uh, in 2016 in this county, 57-42 uh, in the absentees. The margin district-wide for Donald Trump was 55 to 39, so running, you know, 15 points off his number here, that's an encouraging sign for Democrats. This is a county where Trump got 66, uh, this is a county where Trump got 66% of the vote, I should say, uh, in 2016, running at 59 right now, so some early indications there. Democrats Democrats expected to do better. We're going to find out as more of this comes in, especially around Lexington, if it's better enough for them here. Steve Karnacki for us with the data. I want to tell you that I said a moment ago that we are going to get to Georgia. We are about to get to Georgia. We're not only looking at what's going to happen there with that race. We've also got some exit poll data showing voters concerns about voter suppression and whether or not eligible voters will have their votes cast and counted. We've got interesting anecdotal information about how that's been going in Georgia today uh, and new raw data about voters concern as they head to the polls in that critical and could be historic race. That's when we come back. Stay with us. Election Day began today with reports of mechanical glitches and human errors uh, leading to long lines and frustrated voters in precincts all around the country. Look at this line in Gwinnett County, Georgia today, Greater Atlanta. Uh, the batteries inside a polling machine there had died 
It took nearly two hours to find a power cord to charge up that machine. So for want of a single power cord, all these people gave up all this time today just trying to vote. Wow. Uh, storms overnight caused power outages in Knoxville, Tennessee. At one polling location, voters literally had to cast paper ballots by lantern light, which doesn't make for great TV, but is a great story. Uh, Chandler, Arizona, though, just outside of Phoenix, wins for the weirdest voting problem of the day. This morning, when poll workers showed up just before 6 a.m. local time to open up, they discovered that the landlord had foreclosed overnight on the office where people were supposed to be voting. <laughs> for closing on the office, locking the poll workers out, locking voters out, and locking the voting machines inside where no one could get to them. It's been that kind of a day. Tremaine Lee uh, is at a polling place now um, in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, Tremaine, thanks very much for joining us. What have you been seeing today? Hey, Rachel, thank you very much. Here in Atlanta, Georgia, where voters uh, may be poised to make history by possibly electing uh, the first black female governor in the United States. Uh, but this race has been controversial from the very beginning. Uh, concerns about voter suppression efforts, especially uh, coming down from Brian Kemp, uh, the Secretary of State, who is also running for governor. Uh, but also, not the least of which is the gutting of the Voting Rights Act. You talk to folks around here who have been around the block a few times, and they say they saw this coming a mile away. But today, even though there's excitement and long lines everywhere you go, there's also concerns about voter suppression efforts and things going wrong at the polls. I want to bring in Derek Johnson, the head of the NAACP. Um, Derek, what have we been seeing out there? There have been some concern across uh, counties and across Atlanta that these voter suppression efforts are actually working. Some funny business at the polls. Yeah, well, well, we're preparing a lawsuit right now to extend the voting time for a, a priest in Gwinnett County with the Lewis Committee because you had voters standing in line for over four hours because they didn't have power cords. Uh, we're finding the same stories in Fulton County, and we're standing outside the Morehouse precincts where students are being turned away because of the exact match. Uh, it is unfortunate that Brian Kemp did not step down as Secretary of State to ensure we had a fair election. How much of this do you think is just mismanagement of the polls, and how how much of this might be nefarious? Well, whether it's malicious intent or benign neglect, it is something that should not take place for this election cycle. We should have a transparent and fair system. He should have stepped down. Uh, in fact, I, I wish we could bring criminal charges against how he's treating our democracy during this election cycle. Is there concern that any of this, the swirl of controversy, what we're seeing at the polls, will impact voter behavior or has vote, um, impacted voter behavior at all today? Well, I am excited with the level of enthusiasm, the determination of voters to stay in line, and I'm encouraging voters to stay in line, whether you're in Georgia, whether you're in Florida or Maryland, or any of the states, because no matter what, don't leave the polling place unless you cast a ballot, whether it's a provisional ballot or an actual ballot. Uh, inside this auditorium uh, in Morehouse College, there are still over 100 people still waiting in line. So students all day, the line stretch down the block a little bit. Uh, I talked to a volunteer, you see behind me, there are a whole bunch of poll watchers said that at every hour of every um, the moment today, the line stretched to 150 people or more. There's still young people in there ready to vote. Um, there's excitement, but also a lot of concern. Tremaine Lee for us in Morehouse, at Morehouse. Really appreciate you being there for us, uh, Tremaine. You're mentioning there about concerns about voter suppression. We do actually have uh, some new exit poll data. NBC News was able to do uh, exit poll data at <clears throat> Georgia voters in terms of their concerns about voter suppression. And look at this. The concern that people who aren't eligible to vote will nevertheless be able to vote, that's 41%. But the concern that eligible voters will be prevented from voting, uh, that beats it by double digits. That is at 51%. And if you break it down by race among Georgia voters, you're gonna see why the numbers shake out that way. The concern that people not eligible will vote is a concern of a majority of white voters, 54%, but among African-American voters, look at the concern that eligible voters will be prevented from voting. 73% of black voters in Georgia are saying they have concerns that eligible voters uh, will be blocked. Um, I have concerns that there's an extra L in the first mention of eligible on that screen, but that's the sort of thing that I'll have to take up during the commercial break. Uh, for now, we're going to go to Ari Melber, who's the host of The Beat, who's actually been uh, monitoring stories like this, concerns like this, and the anecdotal evidence, the statistical evidence that we're seeing tonight that there may be worries about the vote across the country. What do you got, Ari? That's right, Rachel. Focusing in on Georgia, where, as you say, this has been an issue from the start. To put it in context, Brian Kemp 
purge triple the number of voters that made the margin of re-election in the last governor's race. So we are talking about something that could decide this race tonight. Everyone fired up about it. The news I have for you is a late-breaking lawsuit here just within the last two hours that is trying to remove Brian Kemp from overseeing the rest of this election. That's something that a lot of people have been talking about. We just heard Derek Johnson from the local NAACP talking to Tremaine Lee about similar efforts. So this is something that could also matter tonight or going forward if there's a runoff or certification. All of this relating to issues you've been covering when you look at the uh, attempted cyber hack information Information that was put out that many people saw as basically lacking evidence as an effort to intervene, the voter purges, uh, and some places we've seen today lines of hours in Georgia. So we're tracking all of this, and it's the kind of thing that, like so many other races tonight, if it's tight, these things could decide it. If there is a blowout in one direction or another, these issues tend to fade into the background on election evenings. Now, Ari, let me ask you just about that lawsuit that you said was just filed. Obviously, this is election day. This is election yeah. evening. Polls are about to close and closing all over the country. Um, I know know from covering these issues, as you do, that the courts are always very reluctant, as a matter of Supreme Court precedent, to get involved in election matters too close to an election. I mean, what do you, what does it mean to have an election, to have a lawsuit filed on election night, trying to get Kemp out of the middle of the election that he's running in? Well, you're exactly right. The courts generally want to avoid anything that would look like them getting involved in the politics, but they also have a countervailing obligation to defend voters' rights. What this is specifically, and we just got off the phone with Larry Schwartzman in Georgia, is several voters saying remove Kemp. All right, thank you very much. Much appreciated, my friend. We're going to go to a break, which will be our last break before we uh, reach the top of the hour. Just a reminder, our 7 o'clock closings include Georgia, Indiana, Kentucky, South Carolina, Vermont, Virginia, just over 12 minutes away. This break, and then we're back with live returns. Welcome back. Just about eight minutes before the hour. That means eight minutes before some of these reportable poll closings we'll have for you. And our promise to you all evening long is when Steve Kornacki gets enough numbers to report to us, we will go to Steve Kornacki in the coach's corner. Hey, Steve, looking at you, you've got something from Kentucky. Yeah, we've been talking about that uh, key house race there around Lexington. So let's take a look here. And first of all, I'll, I'll give you this in a second. I just want to explain if you're seeing this for the first time, what the heck you're looking at here. Maybe I should just set this up. You know, 435 districts out there. A lot of them we pretty much know going into the night it's going to be Democratic, it's going to be Republican. So the gray here kind of represent the non-competitive districts. And as they're called officially throughout the night, they're going to fill in red and blue. You see a couple of the expected Republican ones have already been called. What you see in yellow, though, we think that's the battlefield tonight. We think that's where control of the House is going to be decided. We've got 66 of them highlighted here. What they are are 66 Republican-held districts where Democrats Democrats, we think, have the best chance of getting pickups. And what Democrats need to do, the name of the game for them tonight, is a net gain, a net pickup of 23 seats. So we think this is going to be the heart of it here for Democrats. There could be surprises. There could be districts off this list that pop up. If there are, we will get them to you. But we think the action is mainly going to be concentrated in here. So that's why we've set it up this way. And of all 66 of these districts, exactly one of them has votes coming in right now. It is that 6th District of Kentucky we've been talking about. And we can now give you an update and you see it is nip and tuck Andy Barr the Republican incumbent by a fraction of a point now leading Amy McGrath still in the early going this is mainly absentee vote that's coming in but what's happened here if you remember in the very early vote Barr was leading by a lopsided margin what's happened here as we said sort of McGrath is going to sink or swim based on what happens right here this is Fayette County this is Lexington this is the University of Kentucky this is uh, this is one of only two counties in the state of Kentucky that voted for Hillary Clinton in 2016. She won Jefferson County, where Louisville is, and she won Fayette County, where Lexington is, and she won nothing else. So she got 51% of the vote here in 2016. McGrath running at 59%. The benchmark I've kind of set in my head for this is 60%. McGrath wants to, I think, be on the north side of 60%. She's on the cusp of that. This looks like the absentee vote. We will see what happens when more comes in, but you can see that she is going to sink or swim on that, because if you go to the outlying
outlying areas. You've got very Republican areas uh, in the outlying parts of this district and see a lot of red there. You'll probably see some blue around Frankfurt, but McGrath getting the lead there. And again, to go back uh, to the big board here, we say only one district where we're getting action right now. In less than 10 minutes, that's going to change in a big way. All these districts in Florida, we're going to start getting results. Four competitive districts in Virginia, we're going to start getting results. Two right here, small geographically, but big in terms of the stakes right outside Atlanta. The sixth and the seventh going to start getting results. So things are going to really be picking up here in the next couple of minutes. Steve Karnacki, thank you very much. One of the big Senate races that has received more than outsized national attention is the Ted Cruz reelection Senate race in Texas. He is running against a national Democratic phenom named Beto O'Rourke. No Democrat has won a statewide race in Texas in, oh, say, 25 years. Uh, but Beto O'Rourke has become a national story for a reason. The numbers say that Ted Cruz should have no problem. But this race has taken on a bit of a uh, sort of a life of its own. And now I'm going to say a word that you didn't expect to hear tonight on our broadcast. Um, Chris Hayes tonight is at the Southwest University Ballpark, uh, which is in El Paso. It is the home of the El Paso Chihuahuas. Who had Chihuahua on their election night words, Rachel might say, bingo card? Uh, Chris Hayes is there for us with the uh, different kinds of campaigns that Democrats are running in statewide, ele statewide elections tonight in Texas. Chris, what are you seeing? You know, it's a first of all, it's a gorgeous ballpark and it's a gorgeous town. Look, this is the site, I think, of one of the most interesting experiments, the most interesting experiments of democratic politics happening in the nation. It's connected to things happening in Georgia and Florida. The numbers don't work for Democrats in this state statewide for 25 years, as you said. They have been running candidates from Houston and from Dallas, mayors, not, you know, statewide figures. It hasn't worked. Beto work got into this race, low name recognition. He's from El Paso. No one has ever been elected statewide from El Paso. People didn't know what he was. He rejected PAC money. Money. Can't do that because you need to raise money. Threw out the old playbook, went to all 254 counties, raised enormous sums of money nationally and in small dollar donors and became a phenomenon. And here's why tonight is going to be interesting. In 2014, there were 4.7 million votes cast, and the election year in 2016, 8.9 million. The Cruz people came in thinking it was going to be a 6 million vote night. Right now, all the politicos and the most sophisticated data folks say it's going to be an 8 million vote night. That's a 2 million vote miss for the modeling for the Cruz campaign. Hmm. So the question becomes, who are those voters and where did they come from? But I can tell you, I spent all day talking to Texas politicos on both sides of the aisle, and there is a palpable sense of uncertainty about this. And it's because O'Rourke chose to do something bold and different than what others have done before. He did not tack to the middle. And you've seen Stacey Abrams in Georgia do that, and you've seen Andrew Gillum do that in Florida in states where they went out and said, we're going to go find the votes because the math, the way that we've been doing the math in these states as statewide Democratic candidates has not been working. And one thing is clear, this way of doing it, I think, at the end of the night is going to end up with Beto O'Rourke outperforming a lot of those candidates who went with the traditional approach in the last 25 years. Chris, one of the things that matters a lot when you take that kind of approach, when you try to get people out voting who haven't voted before, who aren't used to participating, particularly in non-presidential years, is you have to start thinking about how hard it is to vote or how easy it is to vote in that state. One of the things that we hear nationwide about why Texas won't budge, even as its demographic keep changing in what looks like a democratic direction is because it's hard to vote in Texas, that it's hard to register, yep. it's hard to vote. They go out of their way essentially to make it as arduous as possible, as arduous as possible a process. Um, how has the Beto O'Rourke campaign dealt with those just logistical issues that are specific to that state? Well, you've got the Texas Civil Rights Project just in the last hour has successfully petitioned to have Harris County, which is where Houston is, and uh, went actually Democratic in the last presidential election for the first time in a while to have a bunch of polling locations stay open there. You're exactly right. The Republican legislature in this state, along with the governor, have put through a raft of restrictive laws from a voter ID as well as uh, other obstacles that have been put in place. And it has been a low turnout state. It was even a low turnout state before those obstacles. It has been a low turnout state then. The O'Rourke campaign really Really has just been trying to sort of sheer brute force. I mean, they've built this machine with $75 million they've raised. They've hit a ton of doors. And the idea is you get as many people to the polls, you have lawyers there to protect their vote, and you hope for the best. Chris Hayes for us in El Paso. Chris, thank you, my friend. Much appreciated.
Uh, we are now uh, under a minute away from the top of the 7 o'clock hour Eastern Time. As you heard Steve Kornacki say, this will be the hour that our board will start to light up. The competitive house races will start to reflect themselves on the board. On the right, you see the states that are a half a minute away from closing. Georgia, Indiana, all of Indiana, all of Kentucky, South Carolina, Vermont, and Virginia. And in the lower right-hand corner of your screen, you see what the stakes are tonight. There is not a candidate, a single national candidate, as there would be in a presidential election, but for many of the Democrats, many of the Republicans watching, that candidate is named 23. The 23 seats the Democrats need to take control of the House. Now, the 7 o'clock hour has arrived, and we have the following projections. In Indiana, in in the Senate race there, the Donnelly race, we're calling it too close to call at the top of the 7 p.m. hour. In Vermont, no surprise, the re-election of Bernie Sanders, the independent who caucuses with the Democrats. In Virginia, no surprise, Hillary Clinton's former running mate, Tim Kaine. This is the race Kaine was in against Corey Stewart, who made a big splash early, not so much along the home stretch. The U.S. Senate at this hour, and this, of course, is fluid and will change all night. That is the undecided portion in gray of the U.S. Senate. We'll fill in those seats as we go and erase so many of you are following, so many people have asked about. Georgia, Governor, too early to call, Abrams versus Kemp. But Steve Kornacki sure looks busy over there at that board. Steve, what do you have at the top of seven? Well, I say with Georgia, Florida, Virginia, they're starting to close right now. And as you can see, we've got, say, there's two that we're keeping an eye on, two battleground districts here in Georgia, right outside Atlanta. And I'm just seeing quickly, it doesn't look like there's any vote yet. But let me just tell you, how these are so important, obviously, because for Democrats, these are flip opportunities. But also, these are directly related to that governor's race. And let me just quickly show you how the sixth district here of Georgia Remember this one. This is where Democrats dumped 30 million bucks last year trying to get John Ossoff through a special election. That didn't work out. And yet here we go again. This is one of the most closely watched races out there. The story here, this is right outside Atlanta. This is the suburbs. About half the district here is the Fulton County portion, largest county in the state. Uh, now, this is where Karen handled in that special election. She did well here. But if you're getting that surge Democratic turnout that Stacey Abrams is about, this is one of the places you'll see it in Fulton County in this portion of the district. You'll also see it in DeKalb County. This is about a quarter of the district. Handel lost here in her special election for the governor's race. You'll see it here too. You'll probably see a little bit of too. You'll probably see a little bit of it in Cobb County too, the Cobb County portion of this district. So if, if Stacey Abrams is delivering in the governor's race, especially in this Atlanta area, it could spill over to this district and it could also spill over right next door to the seventh district. This was sort of a late arrival on the Democratic target list, on the national media's list. You had Rob Woodall, the incumbent there. He is... Uh uh, he's in a tough race. I'm told we may have some numbers here in Florida. Let me just quickly see. We do. So Florida, huge early voting state, right? We get a lot of vote. We get it very fast. You see, we've already got over 100,000 dumped right now. Rick Scott, the challenger, running ahead here. But you can see all of this is coming from one county. Pasco, oh, this is interesting. Pasco County in 2016 was the county we looked at in the Gulf Coast region and we said something's happening here for Trump. Now this is just early vote. This is just early but when Donald Trump, Pasco County uh, north of St. Petersburg, what you get here a lot of retirees, a lot of folks from the Midwest, they come down to the Gulf Coast uh, they're in Pasco County. Rick Scott it, it, early on here, so I'm not saying read anything into this, but keep an eye on this one because this is the question we're asking tonight in the Senate race and in the governor's races. Can Scott can DeSantis perform at that Trump level in places like Pasco County, or does it recede? Does it go back to where Mitt Romney was in 2012? It wasn't enough for Mitt Romney in 2012. It was enough for Trump in 2016. So getting our first, this is another one to keep an eye on. Citrus County, it'll be a Republican County. The question is, how much is it going to be a Republican County? So just getting a scattering in, and it looks like some Democratic areas, Osceola County, the story in Osceola County, going to be a large Hispanic vote here, particularly there is a large Puerto Rican population 
uh, in Osceola County, talking about like Kissimmee here. So Bill Nelson expected to win here. But again, we talked about the you know, Puerto Rican vote, especially in, in light of the uh, disaster there last year. What effect might that have? This is a county to keep an eye on. So the vote, the early vote starting to be tabulated fast here in Florida. You got three counties spitting it out. Just try to make some sense of this. And I'll let you know when I got a little bit more for you. Steve, can I, not to put you on the spot here for a second, but um, out of Virginia, NBC has projected that the winner of the Senate race in Virginia will be Tim Kaine. To get that kind of projection right at poll closing uh, means that it was not a close contest between him and Corey Stewart. But it does make me wonder uh, about the Virginia House races uh, that have been of such a point of focus for Democrats. I know there's about a handful of Virginia races that Democrats think they might be able to flip. I also know that Virginia tends to count a little slowly. Uh, it looks like we're not seeing any numbers yet out of those races. Yeah, we're not. But you mentioned, so Corey Stewart, the Republican who we are now saying is going to lose that Senate race there. Republicans were nervous about the effect he might have down ballot. Keep an eye in particular. There are four Republican held seats in Virginia Democrats are targeting. Number one up here is the 10th district right outside Washington, D.C. It'd be a disaster for Democrats if they don't get that one. But keep an eye on this one. The 5th district. Now, this is a Republican held seat here. It is an open seat. The population's kind of spread out, but look what's right in the middle of it. Hmm. Charlottesville. Albemarle County outside Charlottesville here. Charlottesville itself, a very Democratic town. You expect the Democratic strength to be there, but if you look at the combination of the legacy of Charlottesville from a year ago, the impact that might have had on the local population, also the fact of Corey Stewart with all of his controversies being at the top of the ticket, this is a particularly interesting one to watch. Democrats have targeted it. Leslie Coburn, their nominee, polling has showed her close in this race. So it's one of the four to keep an eye on here. The other one we're, we're monitoring too. There's the uh, there's the Dave Brat district around. I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to get over there. I'll get that in a second. There's the Dave Brat district. It's the suburbs of Richmond, and then also Scott Taylor down in Virginia Beach. Four in total in Virginia. We're keeping an eye on as well, where Democrats are targeting. Steve, just smack it. It usually works. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Oh yes. Oh, Two. Oh. Come on. We've got, we're, we're in this together. Right. We're, <laughs> never apologize. We're in this with you. <laughs> Any of us who've tried to make an iPad work, <laughs> it's fantastic. <laughs> Hi, we're still. Oh, you're right. I thought, yeah, I thought no, I was no going to throw it back to you. I was gonna, let me just check to see if we've got some in Florida, and I will, I'll just shout right back to you. How about that? I think that? that's a polite way of saying you guys talk among yourselves. <laughs> Yeah. Obviously, the East Coast closings, uh, 7 o'clock closings, mm -hmm. 7 o'clock Eastern, we knew was going to be um, a big deal. We're not getting a ton of surprise at this point. But, I mean, all the way up to Maine, all the way down to the, the southernmost district in Florida, there are races that the Democrats think they are going to flip along the East Coast. Yeah. And, I mean, the president's approval rating is bad, but it's not terrible. You know, the, the, the Democratic wins tonight in the exit polls, the first round of exit polls, all look like they're going the, the Democrats' direction. I mean, at some point, you know, the de Democratic confidence tonight is going to run up against real numbers. But starting to see these numbers come in on the East Coast, you can just sort of feel 2016 coming, washing back over you right now in terms of the expectations, pollings, and yet we don't have the real and numbers. And talk about, I mean, Florida, Florida, Florida. There's so much PTSD tied to Florida, 2000. Um, <laughs> you know, the recount. Um, <laughs> I election night, I mean, and, and I think on election night, I remember sitting here in 2016 when Trump won Florida, that was when the night started to turn Yep. From the Trump campaign's perspective, mm -hmm. I mean, when they won yeah. Florida, I think that was the first time, and, and people have reported this out, mm -hmm. that people, and they didn't write a victory speech, they didn't think they were going to win until Florida went for Trump. So to see Florida, and, and all the polls have had Andrew Gillum up a little bit, I mean, to see Florida now possibly swinging back to being run by a Democrat is remarkable. And, and you, you know, I know there's so much, talking about PTC, there's, there's so much trauma from getting it wrong from our side of, the, uh, of it and, and for the Democrats. But this is, if, if Democrats have a good night in Florida, that, that, that says something really important about the next two years. Mm -hmm. And in Virginia, honestly. Virginia? I mean, Virginia, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. because exactly. Virginia has off your elections at the state level, Virginia's already had a chance to weigh in in the post-Trump exactly. landscape. And when Virginia went to go vote in the first nationally watched elections after Trump was elected, they went blue hugely, right? The popular vote for the state legislature was like double digits. Yep. Yeah, Democrats no, it was favored. amazing. It was amazing. Um, and the polling before that, that uh, interestingly, did not really catch that. That, the right. blueness of that wave, yes, um, which, which was kind of interesting. And, and Democrats and ascribed really... it to get out the vote and turnout and enthusiasm mm -hmm. stuff that you yeah. can't necessarily measure on paper. Yeah, the Democrats almost took the House of Delegates within like one uh, seat, which was not 
ever going to happen. Well, and had it, the state it, not it, been it gerrymandered, happened. they would have taken. They had the, mm -hmm. had that legislature yeah. not been gerrymandered, they would have taken oh, the yeah. House of Delegates by a mile. Yeah. I mean, that's the other thing that's going on tonight, and, and we don't really talk about it because it's become the climate, and so we don't talk about it when we get regular storms. But the. This, the country is gerrymandered to structurally benefit Republican candidates in such a way that if you look at the popular vote for Congress tonight, I mean, Democrats may need to win the popular vote by double digits in order to have a chance at winning control of Congress. That is yeah. why these governor's races and state legislative yeah. races yeah. are as important as these co congressional races because they you know will control doesn't... the redistricting yeah. after the next census. Yeah, if the, t if the playing field is going to be untilted, they will be the mm -hmm. ones who do it. Chris Matthews, I owe you. I just got the eye from Steve Kornacki across the room at the board. Go what do you it. have? Yeah, let's take a look. We showed you Florida Senate. Let's take a look at Florida governor. Now, look, you see a lot of gray on the screen, but we say so much of the vote in Florida is early. So I'm going to show you a screen, and there's going to be a number that's a little misleading on it. I'm going to try to put it in perspective because we got a lot more of the vote than it looks like. This says 1% is in in Pinellas County. 1% of election day precincts are now reporting. You add this up, you got more than 275,000 votes that are counted here. We estimate based on our projections, that's well over half the vote that's going to come in from Pinellas County. This is St. Petersburg. Think of that. Now, take a look here. We said this is the area, uh, that Gulf Coast where Trump did well, overperformed in 2016. In 2016, Trump won Pinellas 49-47 with a little over half the vote. The early vote now in and tabulated DeSantis running three points short of the Trump pace there. Now, that is an encouraging early sign for Democrats. Obviously, it raises the question, election day vote. Republicans seem to have a surge with the election day vote in 2016. Independents seem to break their way. So what happens with the remaining, let's say, 40 percent of the vote from this county when it is tabulated, the same day vote? Was there another Republican surge? Can DeSantis match that number? Or did independents break differently this year? If you're looking at this number out of Pinellas County at the end of the night, that would be good news for Democrats. Same story north of there. We were mentioning Pasco County a minute ago. Again, we expect this is more than half the vote that's already been tabulated here. It says that, oh, the early vote is not routed through precincts. The early vote uh, goes into the county, so it's, it's a misleading number. This is more than half the vote. It's been counted, and you see, again, DeSantis running three points underneath the Trump 16 total there. He's ahead. We expected him to win here, but look at that, a 22-point margin there for Trump in 2016. It's clocking in at 12 right now. Again, I said, is it going to be closer to Romney or closer to Trump? This is closer to Romney. The question is, when they count that same day vote, was there any kind of a Republican surge? So we are starting to get a significant share of the vote in, and I'm just checking here. Okay, Tallahassee, by the way, I just saw this pop up. Uh, again, St. Leon County, of course, Andrew Gillum is the mayor of Tallahassee. This is a Democratic area, but you see, probably not a surprise here. He is overperforming where Clinton finished in 2016 in a Democratic county, his home county. But so Gillum, again, uh, more than half the vote here uh, in Leon County, out to a, a two-to-one advantage there. There. So you see statewide, that's what it all adds up to there. But really, that's my question. Some of these key counties in 2016 where Donald Trump overperformed and surprised everybody on Election Day, can DeSantis, who tethered himself so closely to Trump, trying to replicate that strategy, can he replicate that performance? Or do we look something at something more like 2012? Steve, thank you. And thank you for the context in every case showing us the Trump performance and in some cases the Romney performance. Mm -hmm. And just holler if you have results that we need to go to. In the meantime, we keep telling folks it's going to be a minute before we have answers on Georgia. Uh, Katie Turr is in Atlanta for us at a polling location where people are still in line to vote, even though the polls have closed officially. Hey, Katie. Brian, you just missed a mini celebration here as the last person went up to begin the process of voting here at this church. This has been a packed polling place all day. The workers got here, and let's walk over here. The workers got here at 6 a.m. this morning. They expect to be here for a little while longer counting the ballots. They say the turnout here has been presidential election level. This is not a midterm election. People are excited about voting. Let's try to talk to somebody in line. Hey, ma'am, can I just ask you, you were one of the last people in line. You came in at the wire. They closed the doors right behind you. Yes. Why was it so important for you to come out? Appreciate you. 
Well, uh, all right. <laughs> but obvious <laughs> reasons. <laughs> so, in this race, are you voting because it's, because the governor's race? This is one of the you? most important elections ever. Why? Because of the state of the uh, country and because of the state of the union, I would say. May I ask who you're voting for? No. No. You don't have to tell me. Okay. You do not have to tell me. That. Don't you worry. What about you? You were you're voting for Stacy. You're happy to say that. Yes. Why are you voting for Stacy? Because I just I feel comfortable. Yeah. Were you concerned about voter suppression at all and any of the issues? That's no. That's nope. Having a hard time at all getting your vote cast? No. Well, I, it was hard to get up here. Yeah. yeah. And I was ready to vote. They had lines here, guys, that stretched around the block for hours. I was talking to, to the lady in charge here. Valerie, you want to come talk to me real fast? Valerie, I want to, I want to ask you, what's it, what's it been like here all day? Watching people come in to vote. Crazy. <laughs> Crazy? <laughs> yes. We had we got here at six It's just one word, guys. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> Crazy. We got here at six o'clock this morning, so we had lines all day. Yeah. So Any issues at all? Voting? Uh, people in some time in the wrong precinct and not having patience to wait. And they've cast provisional ballots when they do not that? Not many. Uh, we only had about maybe 15. Got it. And you heard some problems at various other places, but nothing here. No problems. No problems here. You guys have been watching along with us. There have been problems at some Gwinnett County uh, polling places. They've extended some of the polling times in, I think, about two polling places okay. in this state. All in all, I mean, this is, you guys are talking about it. This is a state to watch. It's a race to watch. Yes, we're focused on congressional races, what happens in the Senate and what happens in the House. But the governor's races are so important that the Democrats can take over a number of governor's mansions across the country. That could really change the way voting maps look in 2020 and 2022 and 2024 going forward because these governors will have the power to veto any maps if they're taking over Repu from Republicans, any maps that are drawn by Republicans. So it could look a lot different in the coming years. Katie Turr Guys. in Atlanta. Katie, thank you for that. Reminder to all our viewers that elections are local matters. Elections are successful because of people like the woman we just met. Valerie, my heart goes out to you. <laughs> she gets up there and says, how is it? Crazy. It Problems? No. It was president. He tried to run above, above everything. president came twice, and Scott had to be with him twice, once in Fort Myers 10 days ago, once the other night in, in Pensacola. Yeah. The pattern of where the president visited in the last two weeks and the downturn in the statewide number for that Republican candidate was pretty consistent across the country when I've talked to Republican pollsters. Ted Cruz lost four points after the president visited. Really? That's why McSally mm. and, and, and uh, Heller didn't want him to come in the last on the last visit, I think that Scott's going to ask himself, should, should he? I, look, I had, a, I had a try to say to me, here's the problem with Trump. You're damned if you do, damned if you don't. You can't win without his base, and with him, you can't win the suburb. The explain storm, explain swing how Gillum played that, because Gillum in the last week, we've been trying like hell to get him on our show, yeah. like everybody has. He's determined to stay local. Well, I think in a governor's race, you want to, you, yeah. you know, look, I think nationalizing him got him the nomination yeah. In, yeah. in some ways. But at the end of the day, people, you know, most voters aren't like us putting them in red and blue, you know, T-shirts, okay? <laughs> most people, when they decide on their governor, actually think about the person first. And, yeah. you know, one of the things that I think we're going to, look, Andrew Gillum has run a really good campaign, but he was helped by one of the worst gubernatorial campaigns I have seen in my lifetime in the state of Florida. Ron DeSantis never explained why he wanted to be governor. He just decided one day, I want to be governor. Donald Trump, can I be governor? Will you endorse me? He does. I talked to one high Republican, um, uh, Nicole, in Florida, somebody uh, that, uh, that I know you'd be familiar with, who said to me, you know, I asked him, why is he running? And he said, well, I want to appoint Supreme Court justices. And this person said to him, okay, that's on day one. What are you going to do the rest of your, rest of your term? And he had no idea. Wow. So DeSantis was looking to step up in office, but didn't have, and somebody else told me he'd rather have been a senator than a governor. Can I ask on the- That was on the, clear, because yeah. he wanted to pick federal judges. I mean, yeah. governors don't get to well, do that. Well, the state that. Supreme Court does oh, okay. have three open seats right. that on day state one Supreme. of the new governor, you will get. To, yeah. You do get to appoint those. Has three. Bill Nelson run a better re-election campaign than people have been giving him credit for? I, I, it's hard to say, because I think, look, I think he stayed more competitive with Rick Scott than he gets credit for. but. It's the DSCC that gets credit for this, hmm. for Nelson. And I would say this, because they, 
they poured all the extra money that was necessary. Rick Scott is his own super PAC. Okay, mm -hmm. he put in some. I think I. I mean, he spent more than than both the super PAC and Nelson combined. I think he got into the sixty or seventy million dollars, but they kept Nelson alive, kept yeah. him competitive when it, he could have been swamped with money. Gillum, though, is the special sauce for mm -hmm. Nelson. Okay, because Nelson was. I th look, Scott in isolation. I think wins this race against Nelson mm -hmm. just by simply saying he's been in Washington too long. Right. And here's here's a billion dollars. That's right. <laughs> Gillum was look. The governor's race was the marquee race, not the Senate race. Yeah. This was Gillum, and I think. And at the end, you see Nelson up there with Barack Obama, that's with right. Andrew Gillum, this, Bill Nelson right. up there yeah. looking here's strong, the looking like he's part of a winning team. By the way, and here's the irony to all of this: Bill Nelson's people swore Gwen Graham was going to be the better ticket yeah. made for them. Yeah. It turned out to be absolutely wrong. If state, listen, we're very early. If Stacey Abrams and Andrew Gillum win tonight. I think it transforms how Democrats run in the South. Yeah. I think this idea, if Phil Bredesen doesn't get close, but Andrew Gillum and Stacey Abrams wins, I, I think that this will, it just, just will transform how Democrats think about running in the South. You don't, the, the clinging to the middle and hoping it inspires the Democratic base, you know, Michelle Nunn will now look probably, and Jason Carter, who both just got clobbered in Georgia running that kind of race, are probably looking at Stacey Abrams going, oh, you know what? Maybe some of these progressive Democrats were right. Look at how Bredesen handled Kavanaugh. Yeah. And look at and 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 look at how Beto O'Rourke. I mean, you look at Texas and Tennessee. Bredesen chose one way to run. Beto chose another way to run. Beto has suspension um, tonight. Bredesen doesn't. It looks. Yeah, you're, 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 we'll perhaps. I yeah, mean, but we'll yes. See, I but. mean, that's. I'm just saying that's something that Democrats it, it all, in the South, I think, ought to be thinking about is Gillum and Abrams may be providing a, 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 a more um, fruitful path for them. Yeah, I think it, it also, to vote for. and it makes Trump's racist campaign musings more toxic for Republicans. It makes it a harder bet to stand with Trump. When you're running against candidates whose, whose, whose very presence on the campaign trail sends the message anyone with kids wants to send, it makes Trump's toxicity right. far more perilous. Can I, can I just tell you, and it also, will, I want to remind people, don't just assume you know how the Mississippi runoff is going to go. Mm -hmm. Okay? There's, mm -hmm. there's going to be a runoff. There's a chance that that decides control of the United States Senate. But when you see how other Democrats have, or, or the, the how Stacey Abrams and Gillum ran in the South, and how Beto, Mike Espy is going to look at that, and it's just going to make, like I said, I think it transforms how Democrats run in the South. Going you know, forward. I think the most inspiring picture is what you mentioned uh, a couple of days ago when you saw Barack Obama coming in and holding up the two hands. Uh, Bill Nelson and Gillum, and it was an inspiring picture. African American guy helping out the the white candidate in blunt, mm -hmm. blunt terms. You see there on the graphic what we're coming up on. We're 10 seconds away here. 7:30 poll closings, and Steve Kornacki, we're coming to you after we have the results so far, at least tonight, in the 7:30 closings in West Virginia, a closely watched Senate race. Joe Manchin, speaking of deciding how to handle the Kavanaugh matter, too early to call. Ohio Senate, too early to call, though Sherrod Brown is in the lead thus far and has the advantage. The Senate at this hour, again, uh, pay attention to the uh, undecided, the vacant gray seats in the center over party balance this early in the evening. Ohio Governor, too early to call at 7.30 Eastern time. And one of the big races we keep touching on, so many people are following, Georgia governor, too early to call. Over to Steve Kornacki at the board, what do you have? Steve, I understand that we've got some new important numbers out of some of those Virginia House districts that we've been looking at. Yeah, we said, remember, there are four, four Republican held seats. Democrats are really going after in Virginia where we've got the most votes in right now is right outside Washington, D.C., the 10th district. This is a name you've been hearing a lot about this year. Barbara Comstock running for reelection in a district Hillary Clinton won by 10 points. So it's less than 48 percent in right now again. But we've got well over 40,000 votes. And interestingly, you can see where this vote is coming from, and I think it's going to be pretty instructive. This is Loudoun County right here outside Washington, D.C. This is the biggest chunk of the district. About 40 percent of the vote overall is going to come out of Loudoun County. That's where most of the vote that's in is from. And you can see Wexton, the Democratic challenger running at 56 percent. 56 percent is the exact same uh, vote total that vote share, I should say, that Hillary Clinton got in the Loudoun County portion of the 10th district. 
to Virginia. So she is running at Wexton is Hillary Clinton's numbers right now. And Hillary Clinton carried this district by 10 points. So again, of the four districts, the four Democratic uh, districts Democrats are targeting in Virginia, the 10th is the one they felt the most confident in. It would be a catastrophe for them, I think, if they did not carry the 10th. But they are getting out of the largest part of that district the number they want to see right now. We can also show you starting to get about 20,000 votes now in, in the 7th district. Again, this is rooted around the Richmond suburbs here. Dave Bratt, who set off that political tsunami in 2014, knocking off Eric Cantor. Uh, Henrico this is about a third of the, of the district uh, right here in this county. Still a lot more vote to come. This is encouraging Span, uh, for Democrats here. Spanberger uh, running ahead early, but this is a place I can just give you the number here, which I think she's got to kind of shoot for in this part of the district. Hillary Clinton got 52% of the vote in this part of the district. And Hillary Clinton didn't carry the district. Spanberger might need to get that a little bit higher as the votes continue to come in. Uh, but again, overall in the 7th district, Spanberger out in front by a point right now. And we can very quickly show you, we said that 5th district there uh, in Virginia, the Charlottesville-based district, starting to get some numbers. You see here Riggleman, the Republican, out in front. Now, what hasn't come in yet here is Charlottesville itself. Charlottesville, the biggest sort of single city in this district. What has come in down here by Roanoke, this is the, the most pro-Trump part of the district. And you can see Riggleman. These are Trump numbers so far. Still more vote to come in. But the question was, would there be slippage in Trump country? In the Trump country portion of this district, Riggleman is getting Trump level support right now. So that is what we're seeing in Virginia right now. Steve Kornacki, thank you. In terms of the, um, in terms of what we are watching, and as stuff starts to come in at this point, um, one of the things that we are keeping in mind is the national exit polls tell us a little bit about the direction of things overall. But those turnout numbers are going to be key. So, for example, in that Coburn race, Denver Riggleman versus Leslie Coburn, what Steve is saying is that in the Trump parts of the district, you're getting Trump level numbers, but we haven't seen the non-Trump. We haven't seen the Democratic leaning parts of that district. Yeah. Democrats are counting on not suppressing the Trump vote. They're counting on correct. Turning Changing out huge new numbers the in the Correct. Democratic Party. Right, and in Charlottesville, after Charlottesville, yeah. there, there is going to be a big Democratic vote. Now, we just don't know how big, but, but, but clearly there's going to be a big uh, Democratic vote. So that district is going to be, you look at that margin in Virginia 10 uh, with Barbara Comstock losing to Jennifer Wexton, that's a, that's a big margin. I mean, mm -hmm. that, yeah. that bodes well for Democratic um, hopes of, of taking the There's House. There's the board right there. Big you can margin. see it's just over half the vote yeah. in. I think this is what, I mean, Barbara Comstock has been on every list of the most vulnerable incumbents yep. uh, this year just because that district was plus 10 Hillary yeah. Clinton and because Jennifer Wexton is a very strong candidate and you add those two things together and there isn't much of a way out for Barbara Comstock. It was everybody's early evening bellwether. That's right. Yeah. But if, yeah. it, well, if Barbara Comstock is ousted, she will become, it'll be a landmark. She'll be the first Republican incumbent to lose her seat tonight. And but it won't be enough to tell you much about what's going to happen. It'll be the margin. It'll, uh, it'll, the, the margin will be important. And one thing that, that, <laughs> that Wexton did. She constantly ran ads saying Barbara Comstock voted with Donald Trump 98 percent right. of the time. Yeah, 98 percent of the time. I mean, that ad you just couldn't get away from. And that you know ad. what? That works everywhere and in the country because even the most outspoken <laughs> anti-Trump Republicans in the country, in the House and the Senate, still always vote. 90% of the time right. plus with one, Donald one Trump more. because of the way Congress works. Right, and even Jeff Flake, who I think is now famous for being a mm -hmm. Trump critic, mm -hmm. has voted with him. Most of the time. It's important that we keep, we're going to be talking about turnout all night, and when we talk about the kind of night Democrats are having, it's, if it's good, it's going to be because they grew the pie, not because they, as you said, they didn't suppress any of the Trump vote. But if you need to know how important voter suppression was to the Republicans, just watch Donald Trump in the last 24 hours. He said yesterday, he said yesterday he made up a conspiracy about voter fraud. There isn't widespread threatening fraud people in this about country. their the penalties. Law enforcement but, waiting but, but for he, you th There is no inner monologue. Julie Pace said this once at the AP after interviewing him. There's no inner monologue and outer monologue. There's just monologue. So from Trump's mouth, you heard how important voter suppression was for Republicans. Yes, yeah. I've been alerted. Steve Kornacki has something for us, Steve. We got a bunch we can take you through. Let's go back to that congressional district. The first one we got votes from tonight, the sixth district. District of Kentucky around Lexington. Maybe it's easier if I'm on this side. Amy McGrath, the Democrat, now has jumped out to a lead here. The reason, again, we have been stressing this Fayette County, 40% of the district, the you know, this is basically the city of Lexington. We got now, this is this is about accurate. We got about 60% of the vote that is in from Fayette County. She's running. Remember, we said the benchmark, 60% for her there, roughly. She's running at 60%. And that translates, there's a sort of an imbalance here in terms of a little more Democratic vote in still to come. And I think 
think crucial for McGrath beyond Fayette County is going to be Franklin County. That's where Frankfurt is. Uh, that's got to go Democratic for her uh, to be in the uh, to be in the game here. That's the update there. We can show you quickly Indiana. I want to just again Braun, the Republican, continuing to lead. Only now are we beginning to get votes in here from the big Democratic areas. Marion County, biggest county in the state. Indianapolis. This will be the biggest Democratic county. You can see this is a very low early vote percent historically has come out of Marion County. I think that's what you're looking at here. A lot more same day. There's going to be a lot more votes than this. Democrats keeping their eye on Marion County. They are keeping their eye on Lake County up here, second biggest county in the state. This is St. Joseph County. Notre Dame is here. Joe Donnelly's old congressional district was in this part of the state, so they want to see that. And again, we also want to see, I said at the start of the night, if you start seeing blue in southern Indiana, you say take a trip back in time a little bit here. Barack Obama in 2008 when he won Indiana, one counties in southern Indiana. Joe Donnelly in 2012 when he got elected won counties here. Hillary Clinton was not in the game here, but you do see some blue popping up. These are not complete. Uh, this is sort of, I, I think this will be, a, you got Clark County right here. This is the other side of Louisville. Louisville's kind of on the other side of the river there early on, but let's see if you keep getting blue there. Uh, in, in Florida, very quickly, we now have in, in Florida vote-wise, VA 10, has Virginia 10 just been called? Ladies and gentlemen, we have our first flip of the night. Here it is, the 10th District of Virginia. We just told you the Democrats got the level of support they needed in the key county in Virginia 10. We are now projecting that Virginia 10 will be a pickup for Democrats. That means Barbara Comstock, the Republican, defeated for re-election. And that means critically that our countdown here, we said Democrats need a net gain of 23 seats. It goes down to 22. So Democrats are now 22 away from control of the House. Again, we said this is what would be a catastrophe for Democrats if they weren't carrying the 10th. We figured this would be the first to be called. Mark it down, though, that is the first to be called on this night. Quickly, though, to bring you back to Florida, because we got a lot more vote that just came in in Florida, and I want to quickly take you through it. These three counties right here are the heart of any Democrats' chances in the state of Florida. We now have the early vote in from all those. We have the bulk of the vote in, it looks like, from these counties. And again, Hillary Clinton in 2016 did not carry Florida. She did pretty well. In these Democratic parts of the state. Take a look here. Palm Beach County, Hillary Clinton got 57%. Gillum running uh -huh. at 62. Broward's the biggie. Clinton got 67%. Gillum right now outpacing that. Miami Dade, Gillum running a little bit short of that right now. But then again, we said the Gulf Coast. The question is Democratic strength here, and do you get Trump surge like you had in 2016 in the Gulf Coast? Take a look. Sarasota, this down three points. Again, getting closer to what you would have seen with Mitt, with Mitt Romney. Take a look. You know, Charlotte. It's about level a point off Lee County. Uh, actually, DeSantis is running ahead, significantly ahead. I, I'm just seeing that for the first time, and I'm surprised. That is one place, at least with the early vote, and that's significant. That's over 100,000 votes counted there. That very good news for the Republicans there. Pasco County off the mark. We showed you that earlier. Citrus County. And, and the big thing to keep an eye on here as Gillum leads statewide here with all that vote in. The Senate and the House, the Senate and the governor's race, 52, 48, 2 million to 1.8 million there in favor of Nelson uh, and running. Yeah, the numbers don't quite, uh, don't quite match up, but the margin there, 52, 47, 52, 48. So Gillum in a little, doing a little bit better there uh, uh, head to head, but that's what we've got so far uh, out of Florida. Again, right. big, big picture there in Florida, about half the vote in, the Democrat leading both statewide in both the governor's race and in that Senate race. Uh, and what, going county by county shows us, shows us why they're line, lining up that way. Um, can I ask control room, do we have Alan Gomez standing by for us right now? I wanted to bring Alan Gomez into this conversation while we were talking about those Florida numbers, because one of the crucial things statewide in Florida and nationwide for a lot of races is going to be the issue of Latino voters. Latino voters uh, tend to not turn out in great numbers in midterm elections. Latino voters are a wild card in an election where immigration has been prioritized and with such a ragged edge the way the president has done so for every Republican candidate in the country this year. Alan Gomez is a reporter who has focused uh, for a very long time on Latino voters and the politics of immigration. Alan, uh, in terms of this, these, these Florida results we're seeing tonight and what we're starting to see nationwide, how do you think the Latino vote and immigration are playing? Well, immigration obviously is taking center stage. I mean, it was, it was fascinating to see some of the exit polling you guys were showing just a little while ago where immigration is a number two issue. I mean, if, if you look back just a month ago before President Trump started his sort of assault on the migrant caravan and birthright citizenship and all that, 
immigration was running third, fourth, fifth in some polls, depending on what you were looking at. So that shows that he made it that much of an issue. Well, obviously, we're going to see uh, which way that swings and whether that was a good thing for him. Um, but when it comes to Hispanic voters, you're absolutely right. It's They have historically underperformed dramatically, um, way behind whites, way behind black voters. Uh, last in 2014, 27 percent of eligible Hispanic voters turned out, um, excuse me, of, of the population turned out to vote. Um, all the indications so far is that we are going to see a bit of a surge this year. Um, polling indicates that it could get up to something in the 35 percent, 36 percent range. Um, but because they have underperformed so much um, in previous elections and it's been going just further and further down, we'll have to wait and see. But it, so far, the early returns show that, like everyone else that we're seeing out there, that they're going to turn out a little bit more this year. And Alan, obviously, there is no single Latino community uh, in the United States. There's a, a lot of different types of Latino communities with a lot of different geographic concerns uh, and different ideological alliances. If we do see Latino vote spike in the way that you're talking, going from 27 percent up to something like 35 and 36 percent of eligible voters, how would you expect that to map uh, in terms of partisan affiliation? Obviously, that wouldn't just be a pure Democratic vote. I mean, predominantly, if you look at them on average, they are going to lean more democratic around the country. Um, it's, and if it's somewhere like Florida, things get very complicated because you have the predominantly Republicans when it comes to the Cuban American vote. Puerto Ricans are going to be a really interesting test this year. Um, that's, you know, we talk so much about how this midterm election is a test of the president's policies, and obviously his handling of Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico is going to be, a, that's going to weigh heavily on their decision when they come out to vote. Um, there's a lot more Central and South Americans throughout Florida right now so the Hispanic vote is very is very complicated here in this state but overall when you look around the country when you look at places like Arizona and Texas and Nevada where the Hispanic vote is already big and growing Virginia uh, especially northern Virginia where you guys just called that, that mm -hmm. first race um, that's another place where it's really big I mean I think it's interesting Comstock she ran a very very Trumpian campaign she talked a lot about MS-13 she talked a lot about the dangers of illegal immigration and Look what happened already. Alan Gomez, immigration reporter for USA Today, joining us tonight from Miami. Alan, thank you very much. Really appreciate having you here. If this ends up being on the Republican side, you know, the election of the caravan, where the president put that at the right. absolute center of everything, and it ends up from the Democratic side being Latino voters turning out in record numbers and turfing out Republican incumbents, uh, that will be... Um, the snake eating its tail. And you're right, something <laughs> we thought was going to be a, a plot line from 2016. Uh, just to share our homework with you, we're on our way to another break. Uh, the very patient Steve Schmidt is standing by and will join us on the other side. But let me read off the list of 8 o'clock closings. We're coming up 16 minutes away. Alabama, Connecticut, Delaware, D.C., Florida, Illinois, Maine, Maryland, Massachusetts, Mississippi, Missouri, New Hampshire, New Jersey, Oklahoma, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, Tennessee. If you heard your state in there even if you didn't i would advise you to stay close we'll be right back We are back 11 minutes away from a huge batch of poll closings, and our decision desk is deciding right now what we are going to say about them at the top of the hour. In the meantime, I've told our friend Steve has some new numbers over at the board. Yeah, let's take a look at Georgia. The picture coming in right now, it is, uh, it's very incomplete. You can see the numbers that have been tabulated in overwhelming lead for Brian Kemp, the Republican. The reason these are heavily Republican areas in, in small Democratic counties that have been coming in. The bold game here for Democrats really is going to be in the Atlanta metro area. You don't see much. Here. Look, Fulton County, largest county in the state. This is what we have. We don't have any votes coming out of here yet, but Fulton County, we think we're going to get like 350,000 votes or more uh, total that are going to be cast here. Hillary Clinton won close to 70% of the vote here in Fulton County. Uh, DeKalb County, again, this is going to be, uh, this was 81% for Hillary Clinton. We're going to have close to 300% of the vote. I think this one, though, when this comes in, it's going to tell us a lot. Gwinnett County. There are some precincts apparently where they've held uh, uh, voting hours open a little bit longer. Gwinnett County is a county. It's huge. It has changed dramatically from a demographic standpoint now. Uh, Non-white voters, African Americans, Hispanics, also Asians uh, coming into this for the first time. Hillary Clinton in 2016 as a Democrat carried Gwinnett County. She got 51% of the vote here against Donald Trump. If Stacey Abrams can improve upon that and if Stacey Abrams can build on the turnout there with those, uh, with those voting 
campaign groups we just talked about. That could have a huge impact on the governor's race. It could also, as we say, have a huge impact on that race in Georgia's seventh district, uh, which is most of uh, which uh, most of that district is Gwinnett County. I should note we've now made another call uh, from our battleground. This is a Republican hold. Remember, every district you see here is currently a Republican held district that Democrats are targeting. The sixth district of Florida, Republicans we project are going to hold on to this uh, somewhat comfortably here. So Republicans on this list is 66. They have their first save of the night. Uh, and very quickly, I did want to go back and show you Indiana because it is beginning to tighten as what we said here, Democratic areas beginning to report. This is Gary, uh, Gary, Indiana, Hammond, uh, Lake County, Donnelly doing a little bit better here than Hillary Clinton did in 2016. You're starting to get some vote out of Marion County. You're going to have, you know, close to 300,000 votes out of here before things, uh, before all is said and done. Also, Fort Wayne, this would be, uh, Fort Wayne's the city here, Allen County. If Donnelly were to emerge with a win here, that would be unusual for Democrat. That would be very big for him. So we're starting to see some of those Democratic areas come in there, and that race is going to tighten. So we will keep an eye on that as well with a bunch of poll closings coming up any minute now. On that, just to reiterate what just Steve just said there, in terms of uh, those House races that we're watching, we do have our first flip of the night from red to blue. We've got Barbara Comstock, Republican member of Congress, losing her seat in Virginia uh, to Democrat Jennifer Wexton. Uh, and that Republican hold that Steve just outlined there, that's actually the district in Florida that Ron DeSantis used to hold. He had to give up that House seat in order to run for Florida governor. Uh, Waltz is the Democrat uh, who came in to run to hold that seat for the Republicans against Nancy Soderberg. Waltz will hold that seat. And so that's one of the ones that Democrats had hoped to pick up, if only because it was an open seat. Uh, but the Republicans have been able to hold on there. As we're starting to see the first conclusive results come in tonight, we want to go to our dear friend, the eloquent uh, Republican strategist and former Republican, I should say, uh, Steve Schmidt. Uh, Steve, it's been too long since I've seen you, my friend. It's great to have you here tonight. I want to know, um, big picture, how, how you're feeling about the import of, of this election tonight. I think if you're the Democrats tonight watching this from the National Party headquarters, you have some early reasons to be optimistic. When you look at the exit polls, it looks like Donald Trump was a determinative factor. Steve, with let me inter I'm sorry, I would only do this for a call. I just have to interrupt you for one second. Don't lose your train of thought. We do have a call. Uh, this is in the Ohio Senate race. Democratic Senator Sherrod Brown uh, is projected to hold on to his seat in Ohio, uh, fending off a Republican challenge from Jim Renacci, who had closely aligned himself uh, with President Trump. Sherrod Brown had been somebody who Republicans had sort of salivated at the prospect of knocking off very early on in this prospect, but he will, it looks like, comfortably hold on to his seat tonight. Steve, let me get back to you there. Sorry, sorry, my friend. The, when you look at the race, the, the issue I think that we're going to see play out over the night is the degree to which Donald Trump and Air Force One and the dramatic arrivals in all of these states for these mega rallies where he incited all manner of racial animus. In fact, does it turn out to be a pestilence arriving? Was it a plague of locusts for these Republican candidates? In Ohio yesterday, Donald Trump came, spent the last day in the campaign trail campaigning for Mike DeWine, uh, who's running for governor of Ohio. Did he give Mike DeWine a lifeline or did he push his head under the water? When we look at these Florida returns right now, it seems to be the case that Donald Trump was an anchor around the ankles of the two Republican candidates and may well have been instrumental in bringing about Democratic victories. At the end of the day, what the race has fundamentally been about is a referendum on Trump and Trumpism. Donald Trump has traveled the country. He's incited the American people. He's stoked a cold civil war. He has led a campaign of racial animus, the likes of which we have not seen in the modern era. It is something that would be recognizable to Lester Maddox or to George Wallace. And so what we're going to watch play out over the night is whether Trumpism faces its first validation or its first repudiation. And when you look at the exit polls, when you look at some of the early returns, I would bet on repudiation at this early hour, but it'll be a long night and we'll see how it plays out. Steve, do you feel like Republican candidates have a choice as to how they ally themselves or not with Trump? One of the things Chuck Todd was talking about here early on is that Republicans had hard decisions to make about whether or not they would stand there on a stage with Trump, whether they'd attend a rally if he came to their state uh, to try to put his imprimatur on their own local races. Do Republicans have a choice? Can they say no to Trump and still turn out the Republican 
Republican base enough to compete? One of the things I think that we miss in our analysis and our coverage is this. We tend to say that the election is determined by the last big event that occurs in the campaign, as opposed to the first meaningful event. Hmm. When Donald Trump arrived in Washington, D.C., there were three parties. There was an insurgent Trump party, a Republican party, and a Democratic party. The Republican party capitulated to Donald Trump one by one by one. They surrendered to Trumpism. They became apologists for the incitement, for the cruelty, for the malice for the assaults on our institutions, for the constant lying, for the illiberal assaults on the media. So they made the decision two years ago to tie themselves to Donald Trump, uh, to tie themselves uh, to Donald Trump lock, stock and barrel. That's the decision that mattered. Today, the bill comes due for that decision. So the question isn't what you do in the last week of the campaign, it's what you do in the first week of service. Every single one of these Republicans, by and large, when you talk to them privately or when you used to have private conversations with them, they would tell you that they were offended. They would tell you that they were appalled. They would tell you that they've been in meetings with him and they think that he's crazy, that he's unfit, but they would never say it publicly. And so the choice is to either repudiate or to validate that's the question at hand. And I think that it gives these Republicans a pass to say that they didn't have a choice, that their hands weren't bound. They did have a choice. They had a choice to be fidelitous to the orthodox, they had a choice to be fidelitous to the issues that they claimed uh, belief in for most of their political careers until Donald Trump arrived on the scene. Former Republican strategist, former Republican uh, Steve Schmidt, uh, thank you for joining us, Steve. Um, sobering, um, as always. And Nicole Wallace, you and I were talking about this off camera the other, uh, a few minutes ago. There are Republicans who repudiate Trump, who call the president out on specific matters, uh, and even call him out in general in terms of his overall approach to politics, and then they quit. Nobody yeah. calls him out and then votes against him or stays in office and decides to fight. And, and we shouldn't exact, there aren't many. I mean, you, you don't need two hands to count them. But the, the, the most specific was Bob Corker. He questioned his competence, his fitness to serve. He called this West Wing adult daycare. And then he pooped. And then he actually put. held a hearing to, to sort of hear expert testimony about uh, a president's nuclear so, just, just, here, just before the poll closings in less than two minutes, we've got a call. Yeah, we've got another flip. You have your second flip of the night. This is the 27th District of Florida. Ileana Ross Layton, the Republican who declined to seek re-election, uh, this seat is now going to go Democratic. This is one that Democrats were worried about a few weeks ago. They nominated Donna Shalala against a former television anchor here. A district Hillary Clinton won by 20 points, but there's a large Cuban-American population here. There was a concern that Shalala uh, was not faring well as a candidate, but now we've projected she has won the 27th district. This is a flip. This is the second Democratic pickup of the night. They began the night needing 23. They now only need 21. We've also made a call in the same area, the third Miami-Dade based Republican held seat, Mario diaz Balart. He has held on, and I believe we have another call just coming in right now. We said that district, that Charlottesville based district, Democrats were hoping to win. We said that Riggleman was doing well in the Trump part of the district. He was doing very well. Denver Riggleman projected to be the winner there. Democrats do not get the pickup, so we now have five calls from our target list. Democrats have picked up two of them. Both of these districts, be clear on this, both of these districts were those districts that Hillary Clinton had won in 2016, now throwing out Republicans when it comes to Congress, so Democrats now have taken two off that target list in the House. Steve Kornacki at the board, thank you. We're uh, coming up on 30 seconds away from the 8 o'clock Eastern calls, a huge list. We're going to go after the Senate races first. Uh, we're going to uh, break internally, then we'll take a uh, look at the governor's races. But here is the list of states we'll be coming up on, starting with Alabama, ending with Tennessee. We've had some split closing times as we approach again the 8 o'clock clock hour here in the east um, and we're going to start with one that we've been covering uh, tonight uh, we just don't have the finishing data on it as eight o'clock arrives Florida governor too close to call at this hour Florida Senate also too close to call Missouri Senate closely watched race tonight too close to call at this hour 
Tennessee Senate, too early to call. Blackburn is the early leader in that race. Massachusetts Senate and the next six people are going back to work in the Senate. Let's just say that. Elizabeth Warren, no surprise. Connecticut Senate, Chris Murphy going back, no surprise. Delaware, Carper is going back. The Democrat, no surprise there. Ben Cardin in the state of Maryland. In the state of Pennsylvania, Senator Bob Casey. In the state of Rhode Island, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse. Over to New Jersey. Too early to call, though. Bob Menendez is in the lead, something of a huge undertaking given uh, the campaign that Hugan mounted against him. Angus King, the independent in Maine who caucuses with the Democrats, too early to call. He is in the lead, however. And then in Mississippi, uh, this is, a, by the way, to look at the current Senate. Again, those undecided seats in gray. That's what to concentrate on until we get a little later in the evening. I got ahead of myself. Mississippi Senate. We have two races. We're calling them one and two. Too early to call. Too early to call. When we have a minute, we'll explain just how this is going to work in the state of Mississippi. We may end up looking at, uh, we may be looking at a runoff in Mississippi Senate yes. uh, and that race there on the right. Uh, we want to go back to Steve Kornacki right now because while Brian has been running down those Senate and governor's calls, Steve has been getting in the data to, I think, call a few more of these House races, right, Steve? Yeah, we don't have any more calls, but we, we've got a, numbers coming in everywhere, and we just want to take you through what we're looking at right now piece by piece. So first of all, we'll start in Virginia where we've had two calls. Remember, four target districts there for Democrats. They've won the 10th. They, are, they have lost the 5th district. The 2nd district, this is Scott Taylor. That wasn't supposed to uh, flip there. Let me just make sure I've got that back to even. Okay. Scott Taylor, embattled Republican incumbent, trying to hang on. The story in this district is largely Virginia Beach. It's about two-thirds of the vote is going to come out of here, Virginia Beach. Now, this is a, a Trump won this portion of the district by four points in 2016. So Taylor right now performing as he needs to there. He's going to have to do that, continue to do that because uh, in the other two portions of the district, we've got vote here. Uh, the Democrat in, in York and really in Norfolk, the Democrat is exceeding Hillary Clinton's numbers. So we're keeping an eye on that one. We are keeping an eye on the 7th District of Virginia. Remember, the Richmond suburbs here, Abigail Spanberger leading very slightly over Dave Bratt here. This would be a major pickup for Democrats if they were to get it. The 6th District of Kentucky, we've been talking about this all night. Those rural areas starting to come in now. Andy Barr has taken a lead over McGrath, although you see it's very tight. About 3,000 votes separating them. So that one looking very close right now. We've got a few others in Florida of note. Carlos Curbelo, again, Republican running for re-election in the district that Hillary Clinton carried. Curbelo right now, this is largely Miami-Dade, plus you go out to the Florida Keys here. He's running very slightly behind there uh, as well. Two more in Florida to quickly show you. Brian Mast here, he is running ahead right now. That was not supposed to color. And one more we can just check in on the 15th district. We showed you earlier, Ross Banner, the Republican. We said those numbers were looking decent for him early. And you can see he's leading by six right there uh, at the moment. Can I ask you one? I'm sorry. Can I just interject? Can I ask you one quick question about yes. Virginia Five? Yes. Uh, Steve, that's the race uh, that, as you mentioned, includes Charlottesville. You've called that now. Denver Riggleman, the Republican, holding that seat for the Republican Party. Uh, Leslie Coburn was the Democratic challenger there. How big of a prize is that for the Republicans? Were they really expecting to hold on to that one? I remember that was sort of a lean Republican race, but is that yeah. one that was really on the bubble for them? Yeah, no, I mean, I, look, this was this is one that uh, Republicans, this would be a... a, a almost a catastrophe for them to lose. Okay. You know, the way Virginia went, I, I think the way folks were looking at this coming into the night was the 10th Democrats had to pick up. They've done that. The 7th would suggest Democrats are on their way to getting the House. We're going to see what happens there. That's the Brad the Spanberger race. Right. That's seven, the Richmond yeah. suburbs. The 2nd District, there were some particular issues with Scott Taylor, some uh, some issues uh, around a controversy there in that district. The 5th District's the one where if you added that to one of the others for Democrats, you start, you're start you starting to say nationally that could would mean wave. Uh, so again, the, the story here, I think Democrats not getting the gains they needed. Uh, this is Charlottesville itself right here. This is the county around it, Albemarle County, not getting the gains necessarily needed here to offset the strength that Riggleman got in the, the this next heavily populated portion of the district, which is a very Trump-friendly part of the district. Thank you very much, Steve. Sorry to uh, interject there. No problem. Governor's races are an important part of tonight. We have a partial list of them. Uh, again, some of these closings were at 8 o'clock in Florida. Florida, however, 
Too close to call? We're watching it. Wow, very close. To the state of Pennsylvania we go. Wolf, the projected uh, winner, Governor Tom Wolf, uh, Tennessee, Lee, Massachusetts, Baker, Illinois. Too early to call, though. Pritzker is in the lead. Alabama, too early to call, though. Ivy is in the lead. Rhode Island, too early to call. Ramondo is in the lead. And in Georgia, too early to call. Another widely watched race tonight where the numbers, the early raw has been all over the map. 10% in in that Georgia governor's yeah. race. That year. You mentioned the Illinois race. Uh, that is the governor's race that Democrats most hope to pick up. They have their strongest, uh, I think, confidence in terms of flipping a governor's race. But as bad as the Senate map is for the Democratic Party, with all of these Democratic senators defending their turf in places that Trump won, including a bunch of states where Trump won by double digits, as bad as the Senate map is for Democrats, it is that good for them in terms of the governor's races. And so that Illinois race is first among a lot that the Democrats are hoping to flip, but and those governors really, are really expensive and really expensive. Everything in Illinois is expensive. <laughs> but that'll be those governors races are going to be fascinating to watch over the course of the night because Democrats haven't been shy about having very high expectations there. And they've got some of their best candidates running in these midterms, running in those gubernatorial races. Whatever happens tonight, Andrew Gillum is one of the top Democrats in the country right now. He had the right yeah. message. He had the right tone for running as a Democrat against in, in a climate um, so colored by Donald Trump. Stacey Abrams is a one of the better, one of the best candidates running in this cycle. Um, it's so, killing me that we've only got 10 percent of the vote in in the Georgia governor. Yeah, right. Well, and, and, the, and the Florida and, race and, tightened. I mean, the, the last numbers we showed for Florida represented a real tightening in that race. So I wonder what came in that tightened up the Florida. Steve. Cornacki, forgive me. I'm told Steve has more numbers. Steve? Yeah, well, I just want to set up because I think some things are going to start happening fast here, and I want to get everybody ready for them because, again, the countdown here for Democrats at 21 with Pennsylvania votes coming in right now. Remember, they redrew the district lines in the middle of the year yes. in Pennsylvania, and what that did was it created, first of all, some more competitive districts for Democrats. It also created some accounting issues. So we've been saying that the Democrats, this is all, these are all districts here where the Democrats are are trying to unseat Republicans. There are a handful of districts across the country tonight where Republicans have a chance of unseating or taking Democratic seats. There's one they are virtually guaranteed to get. It is in Pennsylvania. And let me just show you about it. This has everything to do with the redistricting. It's the 14th district of Pennsylvania. They drew this in the southwest corner of Pennsylvania. Under the new lines, Trump would have won this district by 30 points. These are two first-time candidates running for it here. So the expectation is that any minute now, this will be called Republican and that this will become a Republican pickup. We're not going to see many of those tonight, but that would increase that number to 22 if that comes in first. However, I say there were a bunch of new districts drawn in Pennsylvania, and so we have to point out as well that there are a couple that work the other way down here on the other Pennsylvania start the newly drawn sixth district again two first time candidates under these new lines this was a Clinton district and you can go right next door under the new lines a really big Clinton district also an expectation the party the uh, Republicans had pulled out of this race in the seventh uh, this is a Republican seat Charlie Dent declined to seek re-election it's competitive on paper but the two parties were telegraphing they didn't think it was that competitive so there's an expectation of Democratic pickups in these three districts and also one one more out here, a name you'll remember, Connor Lamb, who won that special election earlier this year. The district he won it in being dissolved at the end of the year. He went and he decided to challenge in this newly drawn district a Republican incumbent, Keith Rothfuss. The polling has shown a Connor Lamb out ahead by double digits. The Republicans pulled their money out of this race. So again, the expectation has been that Lamb would win this race uh, and fairly easily. We will see if that matches up. But you can see in the next few minutes, a couple of these districts we expect to flip pretty quickly. There are others. They may take a little longer, but they're expected to flip as well. So I think in Pennsylvania alone, now that the polls are closing there, we're going to get votes. We're going to start seeing this number move around a lot. Steve Kornacki, did I just see you flirting with Jersey 11? New Jer let's see if we've got something in New Jersey 11. I'm going to call that up right now. I'm sorry to look over your shoulder, but I've been doing it all night. Yeah, that, uh, <laughs> we don't have any vote out of New Jersey 11 yet. This is another one, though. Look, for we, we talked about Virginia 10, the Democrats, and, and Comstock. This is another one. They are, Democrats are expecting to get this district with Mike E. Sherrill. It will be a very bad sign for them if they don't.
Okay. Chris Jeez. Matthews, as a Pennsylvania expert, can I just ask you, obviously the redistricting issue in Pennsylvania is a huge deal. It's a big part of why the Democrats think they've got a chance to take control of the House of Representatives. But you don't have a redistricting issue when it comes to statewide races for Senate or for governor. What happened with the Republican efforts to run somebody against Bob Casey or Tom Wolf? I mean, Bob Casey and Tom Wolf are fine, but neither of them is Superman. They both just walked away with those statewide races, and the, the Republican candidates were just nothing. It's very hard to beat an incumbent governor, although they did before, but uh, and Casey's a magic name in Pennsylvania. Mm. It's a, a sweet spot. He's pro-life, but he's a sweet spot with so many of the more traditional uh, Democrats up in Scranton in the uh, northeastern part of the state. He's just an impossible name to beat. I think they didn't want to waste the money. I'm fascinated by what happens in Bucks County mm -hmm. with Fitzpatrick. If they knock that one off, if they go out and knock off uh, uh, Mike Kelly out in Erie, I think there's two or three beyond. Uh, Steve mentioned that they can win out Fitzpatrick there. Fitzpatrick and Kelly, both Republican incumbents. Yeah. yeah, they can knock them off, and they can knock off. They can win the tenth too in Lancaster, so they can win not just the Philadelphia, Collar counties, and Lehigh, which has always been the swing part of the state. If they pick up Bucks County against a pretty well recognized incumbent, uh, they're in business. Well, what, that's how, sweep time. How much of a difference does it make that they had such weak statewide candidates at the top of the ticket? I mean, there is no President Trump on the ticket in Pennsylvania this year. The guy running against Tom Wolf disappeared. The guy running against Bob Casey disappeared. Yeah, that doesn't did. help for their down ticket races. I, I think I know the the, the burbs because I grew right on the edge of Bucks County. I'm telling you, the, the guy at the top of the ticket was on the Republican side. And his name's Donald J. Trump. Yeah. And I think a lot of the women this time and men, more evolved men, as I said the other night, mm -hmm. in the suburbs, I think that Hillary was a complication at the end. I heard from a lot of people. You'd be surprised by find her complicated. Of course, Comey's report 11 days out didn't help. This time, it's all about voting against Trump. The American voter tends to be a voter against. And there was no, the one thing you can say about the Democratic Party, they've been so inactive in terms of legislation or national profile, you can't vote against them. Hmm. Except in a, a few countries. you're out of power, you can't do anything that offends anyone. You're mad, at, you're mad at the one that's running the show, yeah. and, and Trump's been running the show. So I think it's a great advantage to be, uh, to be on offense this time. Pennsylvania, those counties, though, Erie County is a place where it would hurt the Republicans to have the economic message crowded out, which is what happened when Donald Trump grabbed... You spent a ton of time in Erie, didn't I you? spent a ton of time in Erie. Um, I, I get some mail delivered there. But Erie was a place where, where Trump flipped Erie County because of the message about the economy, and no Demo no Republican has been able to run on the economy for the last, I don't know, eight weeks, six weeks, because Trump has been because, obsessed right. with the slow-moving humanitarian crisis mm -hmm. that he calls a caravan. And women are important. I mean, we didn't talk about it with Northern Virginia, but generally, clearly the Comstock defeat is a big part of women. It's a, a called, we call it a bedroom community. Single women in Northern Virginia are very much like the Philadelphia suburbs. They're highly educated, many single. Uh, they're in very uh, liberal on, on social issues, a, a choice, of course, on LGBT issues, very liberal. They, it was just an opportunity for them to vote their feelings and also get the vote against Trump. So I think the I think the big wins are going to come right. in those they suburbs. Didn't, they didn't buy Comstock's uh, MS-13 uh, scaremongering, yeah, yeah. even though there is MS-13 in the Washington suburbs. But people put it in perspective. Steve Kornacki, I, I, I don't mean to interrupt. I've just been alerted that he has new numbers over at the board, Steve. Yeah, Florida has turned around a little bit here. You can see, let's start in the Senate side, the Senate and governor uh, matching up pretty closely. A very, you can see, very narrow lead. Look We're talking 10,200 wow. votes right here for Rick Scott over Bill Nelson, where has that come from? A couple of places we can show you. Remember what I was talking about here? These counties where Donald Trump in 2016 particularly keyed by same-day voters. Not the early vote, but the same-day stuff that comes in later. Were we going to see Republicans match that? Here's one place where they've matched it. Volusia County. This is one of those counties two years ago we were looking at around this time and saying, wow, Trump is doing a lot better than Mitt Romney did four years ago. In Volusia, it was a 12-point improvement uh, in terms of the margin for Trump over Romney, and you can see Scott is basically replicating what Trump did in Volusia County. So that's one example of it. Uh, I'll give you another one. You get down to Collier County uh, down here, getting down near southwest Florida. Rick Scott actually running ahead of Trump's pace right there. I think we showed you Lee County. Think of like Cape Coral here. Again, this is, we talk about the, the Midwest retirees, a lot of them who come down here. Um, you can see Scott replicating those numbers again. So you're starting to see it. Manatee County replicating those numbers 
let's take a look up. We flagged this one earlier. Pasco, uh, again, here you go. Pasco County, with same day, there's improvement here for Rick Scott. So you're, you're starting to see that. Now let's take a look on the, uh, excuse me, on the gubernatorial side uh, in Florida, just to give you a sense of what's going on. The big picture number here, statewide in the gubernatorial race, close to what we're seeing. Uh, this is actually a 35,000 vote margin for DeSantis. Let's just take you through some of those counties again. Volusia County, again, you're seeing a, a similar story. Go down to Collier County, you're seeing a similar story. He's finding it in the same places. One other thing that I would flag here in terms of uh, what Democrats are, are putting up on the board right now, uh, Osceola County. 59-39, that's actually less. The margin for Clinton was 25, still some vote to come, but that's only a 20-point margin in a key Democratic county right there. You can see 24-25 running about even in where Orlando is. So you're seeing, and it looks like same-day vote. In some of those places, Trump did really well, and in 2016, looks like Republicans are getting that today in Florida as well, and you got a very complicated uh, picture there statewide right now. Uh, we're going to try to uh, page Chuck Todd and get him back into the studio as our son of uh, Florida to talk about exactly what is going on in Florida. Steve Kornacki, stay on it and holler if you get anything new. Michael Steele is with us, the former chairman of the Republican Party. And Michael, if you were in your old job tonight, how would you feel about the chances? Uh, I'd be very nervous, uh, to be honest, uh, because there's a lot um, that's still out there, obviously. But when you look at the trend lines, particularly in, the, in a state like Virginia, um, Northern Virginia, that Loudoun County area, uh, has become so much of a bellwether for the state and, and almost for the region uh, as, as the demographic patterns have shifted and changed. Uh, and, and the parties at the state and the national level have to be cognizant of how people are not just moving around, but how that's impacting the vote patterns and where people are going to turn out and how that vote settles down. And I think we're going to see this play out across the country tonight um, in, in a big way, uh, potentially. And you're looking at those numbers in Florida. That race is a lot tighter than I think people thought it would be uh, at this point. Uh, and, and again, that says a lot about how people have kind of settled into their vote. And, and almost settled into old habits in some respects, uh, particularly when you look at uh, the con momentum that someone like Gillum had in the state of Florida. As you're speaking, we're looking at a 50-50 race right there, lower left, Rick Scott, Bill Nelson. On the other side, 49-49 mm -hmm. and change. That is unbelievable. Yeah, and it, it really speaks to uh, just how the voters have processed these elections. Trump is no doubt a factor, but at the same time, he had that ability to sort of settle the vote down for, for a lot of Republicans in key areas, and that'll be interesting to juxtapose uh, against something like, you know, what we see in Virginia right now, where the Democrats have picked up some congressional seats. Does that translate in, in Pennsylvania? Does it translate in Nevada? Does it translate uh, in other parts of the country? That's, go, that's the thing to look at as we go forward and these numbers start to come in. Michael, don't move an inch. Uh, we're going to fit in a break. I'm watching Kornacki at the board looking at county by county numbers in Florida. A lot of stories on the move right now. Please stay with us. We are back, 822 Eastern Time, Ohio Governor. Right now, we have this too close to call between Cordray and Mike DeWine. 30% uh, of the vote yeah, in there. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Uh, Steve Kornacki has been taking an early look at Texas and also these numbers out of Florida. Steve? Yeah, let's just uh, keep on Florida now because we are, I think statewide we got, we're, we're, uh, we've had higher turnout than expected, so our estimate for the overall uh, turnout here has gone up since the start of the night, but still we've got you know more than uh, 7 million votes that have been counted. You see the gap here. It's just gone up as, I've, uh, as I'm speaking about 37,000 vote lead for Rick Scott. Where is their vote left here? Uh, less populated up here in the panhandle, but you can see there are a couple of counties up here where we don't have uh, any vote. This is going to be big for Rick Scott, small in terms of population. Uh, look down here, Miami-Dade. Now, again, remember what I say, that 75%, that 75% of precincts, they don't run that early vote, the mail-in vote, through the precinct. So, uh, the, proportionally, that's, that's a little out of whack. But there is, and it's same thing in Broward, 
I, I'll give you an example. I think here's what we expect in terms of vote out of Broward. This adds up to 474, 480, about 485,000 votes is what this adds up to. I think we're going to be just over 600,000 uh, out of Broward when all is said and done. So there is still vote to come out of Broward. It's not going to double, though, so keep that in mind. Palm Beach almost all in. And again, you see how Nelson is running there. So there are still some Democratic areas, but the, the story, as we said, uh, Scott, and for that matter, DeSantis in the governor's race, the same day vote in those Trump areas, those Republican areas, seems to have come through for them and made this a real game there. Uh, memories of two years ago, certainly Texas. The votes we're seeing now, again, Texas, a heavy early voting state. Take our first look at the Senate race. First look, but more than two million votes counted. Now, the reason, one thing that's helping Beto O'Rourke right now, one of the places where we've got a lot of vote here is Dallas County. You can see over half a million votes have been counted here. This is a core Democratic area. Hillary Clinton got 61 percent of the vote here. You can see in 2016, so Beto O'Rourke is improving on that in a core Democratic area. I think more interesting is when you get outside of Austin, Williamson County here. This is one of the wealthiest. Uh, this is a very wealthy county. Uh, this is Beto O'Rourke doing nine points better uh, than Hillary Clinton did. And also you go to Hayes County on the other side, you know, about a 10 point improvement right there. So those are numbers in that area uh, that the O'Rourke campaign wants to see. But that's very early. You've got some Democratic friendly areas that are in. They need they need to uh, get that kind of shift in the suburbs around the state. They need to have a turnout surge there. Uh, and we got to see what happens as these uh, Republican counties begin to come in as well. All right, Steve Kornacki, thank you. We have two calls to pass along to our viewers. From Illinois, we are projecting Pritzker wins as the next governor of the state of Illinois. A pickup for the Democrats and a hold in Maryland as Larry Hogan uh, will be returning. We have one more Rhode Island governor. It's going to be Raimondo, Gina Raimondo, the Democrat. Uh, and let's go over to James Carville, longtime Democratic strategist. It was, I think, in 2016. Florida was turning mm -hmm. when we went to James Carville. And uh, if you look at the spectrum of Benjamin Moore paints, I don't know what color I would have described <laughs> your face as just at that moment. But whatever blood was draining uh, out, uh, you started to, your mood started to go south, James. How are you, uh, how are you right. thinking about the country right now? Well, I, well, in 2016, I was sitting between Chuck Todd and Hugh Hewitt, and Chuck Todd said that Hillary was running ahead of uh, Obama in Prince William in Virginia and Hillsborough in Florida, and I said, great. And then Hugh Hewitt said, Upshot said there's a 65 percent chance that Trump wins Florida, and I, I knew right there. And the blood did go out of my face. Uh, tonight, there was some hope that the Democrats would have a wave election. It's not going to be a wave election. Uh, it could still be a good election. You know, there's a lot of a lot of drama left in Florida. Some of the stuff I saw out of Texas that uh, Carnegie put up there, particularly Williamson County, I thought was, was encouraging. But, you know, there's still a lot of, a lot of politics left. Uh, but I, I will wait and see. Uh, hopefully the Democrats get the House back. I, I was a little more optimistic uh, about Florida than it's turned out to be. And this, I think we're in for a nail bite in a lot of places here tonight. James, how tough do you think it's going to be? We keep running the number on the right-hand corner of our screen, 21 for the, the Dems in the House. Well, I think they're going to do well in, in some of these suburban seats, you know, uh, in place North Carolina, some of them Georgia would do well, I think it could pick up in Texas. Uh, but the aspiration that pick up a lot of seats doesn't seem like it's come into fruition. A lot of them will be close, and uh, there's still a good chance that the Democrats win the House, but I, I see the chances of, of a wave kind of dissipating every time I see something on the board. James, this is Rachel uh, in New York. Thanks for being mm -hmm. with us tonight. You're talking about the, how you see the wave dissipating and not building there. Um, obviously, the Democrats hope to get control of the House uh, with as big right. a majority as they can get. But even if they've only got a one-seat majority, that means that they will take over the committee chairmanships and every yeah. single committee. Nancy Pelosi will be right. speaker once again. Um, how, how important is the size of the Democratic majority if that wave doesn't materialize, but they do win? Well, I mean, I, look, you always want, you, you need some safety in there. I mean, people could switch, people could die, a, a thousand things could happen. Uh, so you, 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 you want some, some margin there, and, I, you know, let's wait and see. I mean, they still could get it. I'm not, don't, don't get me wrong. I'm, not, I'm saying I, it, this is not going to be the wave election that people like me would have hoped for. It can still be a good election, but some of these races are going to be, you know, very tight, and, it's, you know, it's still volatile down in Florida. You, you still got a lot of Broward out, which is, you know, 
a big, big, big county. And it'd be hard for Scott to make some of this up in, in, in a panhandle, like smaller, but it, it, it's it's going to be close. I, I went in this morning feeling really almost comp, confident, almost to the point of being cocky about Florida. I no longer have that feeling. <laughs> How are you feeling about uh, but, Georgia but, tonight, but, James? <laughs> well, they gotta, you know, we got to count them. I was just saying, I mean, somebody's, the, the vote turnaround in Georgia is going to be so high. You know, in a place like, you know, suburban Atlanta, the, the Fultons and the Mariettas and all these, all these counties start coming in, they, they just dwarf a lot of these rural counties. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of counting left to do. Uh, I'm going to be watching it really close. Uh, but, you know, we'll see. But right now, you know, with Florida Senate is, is kind of central to what's going on, I think. In San Francisco tonight, Democratic strategist James Carville. Mr. Carville, it is always a pleasure and an honor to have you with Mr. us. Thanks for being with <laughs> Thank us. Thank you. I love that mister. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll use that whenever tell you my, need tell it. Tell my children that. I will <laughs> Thank do. You. All right. I will okay. do. And he's a proper Southerner, so he should appreciate the honorific. Uh, we're coming up on 30 seconds away from the next uh, half hour. The uh, poll closings, we only have the state of Arkansas coming in fresh at 830. But we're also going to use this opportunity to update folks on the other races people are so highly interested in and people are waiting for and uh, Rachel's warning her admonition at the top of the evening and it might be a very late night uh, remains uh, true that holds even at this uh, hour of 830 so here we are uh, the poll has closed polls have closed in Arkansas we are projecting Governor Hutchison is uh, handily reelected there uh, and uh, on to the other two we're watching for Florida, too close to call. Georgia, too early to call. So projected on the side of the building we sit in. Georgia race again, only 16% of that vote in in Georgia. In Georgia, the issue of the administration of the election has been like the other candidate in the race. As we yep. talked about earlier this evening, Brian Kemp faced many, many calls, not just from his opponent, but from people like former President Jimmy Carter and from others, uh, that he should step down from his role as Secretary of State administering the election, given that he's also running at the top of the ticket in the election. Georgia's election security has been very, very controversial. There have been a number of lawsuits against the state. There have been a number of election security uh, public complaints and publicly reported issues in Georgia um, when there have been concerns raised by outsiders and by outsiders in this case I mean even the federal government about the security of Georgia elections uh, Brian Kemp has turned that around and made it sound like they must have been trying to hack into Georgia if they discovered those uh, the, the those faults so um, the issue of Georgia voter suppression, him purging hundreds of thousands of people off the, off, off the rolls uh, in advance of this election, um, is inexorable as we watch the vote numbers just absolutely crawl in in that state. And no paper. No they paper they trail. Zero back paper. No back evidence. Back if it back screws back. up, it's gone. Yeah. And a judge in that case, there's a federal judge in that case who's been, who's been considering issues about Georgia, voter suppression and ballot security there. And the judge seemed absolutely poised to order Georgia to finally get mm -hmm. a paper backup, yeah, yeah. but said at the last minute, we are too close yeah. to the election right. to make that kind of Let change. me just interrupt one second. We have a winner in the Senate race in the state of New Jersey. New Jersey remains blue. Menendez, who had so many uh, ethical and legal troubles, uh, has turned away former pharma executive Bob Hugan, ran an aggressive race, especially in the media markets of New York and Philadelphia. But we are projecting when it's all said and done, Bob Menendez returns to the U.S. Senate from New Jersey. We should be clear that visual might have confused you a little <laughs> yeah. bit, right? So this is NBC News projecting that, as Brian said, when all the votes come in, Bob Menendez will have won this race. The actual number of votes in and counted right now is only 1%. Looks and like those show the, the Republican one. challenger ahead. But projections are put together uh, through a lot of things other than just the actually counted vote. So that wasn't a typo. And Bob Menendez looks like he is going back to the Senate. And Steve Kornacki has new numbers from Florida. Steve? Yeah, okay, so the gap here right now for Bill Nelson in this race now has climbed over 50,000. I want to show you where the vote is left because it's beginning to come into focus here. In terms of Democrats and where they can still find votes, two places to key in on. Number one here is
is Broward County. We expect there's going to be about 630,000 votes that are going to be cast here. That means there's probably about 145,000 left to be counted. You can see Nelson is defeating Scott at about a two to one clip here. Uh, so if there's about 145,000 left, uh, would that give you about? Uh, 95, about 100, say about 100, maybe about a 55,000 vote plurality here if, 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 if things broke the Democrats' way here. Miami Dade is a little bit more confusing. We have a range here. There's over, there's about 712,000, 713,000 votes that have been counted here. We think there could be up to 900,000 votes that come out of this county, but there is a lot of confusion here right now about where exactly that's going to land. So that could be the ceiling, 900,000, but it may end up being less than that. Those are two big Democratic areas still to come. Keep in mind, they are balanced by two things, however. The scattering of rural counties, particularly in the panhandle, where there are still votes to come in, not many votes, but they're going to be overwhelmingly Republican, and also a couple of counties with, that have a little bit more population. Let me, uh, let me start down here. Collier County, you can see still vote to come in here. Uh, still a significant amount. Scott winning that one two to one. Uh, if we take a look up here in Charlotte County, still vote to come in here. Scott leading that almost two to one uh, up here in the panhandle as well. There's one additional. So there are still places where Republicans are going to balance out gains that Democrats make in those core counties. Again, right now, let's just see if it's changed. It is now 60,000 votes for Scott in the Senate race. In the governor's race, the margin for Ron DeSantis is it is now approaching uh, 100,000. You're now well. You're at 83,000. 83,000 is the margin for Ron DeSantis in that race. Again, a, a pretty similar turnout pattern holds there as well. We are on it. We'll stay on it. We have to sneak in another break here. Uh, with this proviso, we'll bust out of any commercials for uh, any major calls we have at our election headquarters here in New York. As you look at the state of the Florida Senate race. that we are watching tonight is in the great state of Missouri, where Republicans would so love to unseat Democratic Senator Claire McCaskill, as you're seeing the results there. We've only got 1% of the vote in right now. This is too close to call right now, but as you're seeing, we've got uh, less than 30,000 votes. Joining us now live from Missouri is Senator Claire McCaskill. Senator McCaskill, thank you so much. We know this is an incredibly fraught and busy evening for you. Yes, yeah, a little nerve wracking. <laughs> well, we've only got 1% of the vote in in terms of what we're looking at. How do you feel about how things have gone over the course of the campaign, but also in its closing days? Well, you know, we had to crawl out of a pretty deep hole. Uh, Donald Trump won this state by 20 points. So uh, I've, I'm really proud that we kind of clawed our way to dead even near the end of the campaign. But you know me, I'm going to be really honest with you. I have no flipping idea what's going to happen tonight. <laughs> <laughs> we could win and we could lose. <laughs> yeah, Senator, um, I, I feel like our turnout was great. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. I, I, the turnout was great in places we needed it to be great, but it was also strong in other parts of the state where we're not going to do as well. So I think it could go either way. Missouri is such a tough state. It's like uh, riding a bucking bronco representing that state. I remember of all the weird things, Eisenhower <laughs> lost in 56. He won in 52. Then they dumped him in Missouri. And, uh, and there you are. It's like a bucking bronco or a Missouri mule, maybe. Uh, what, what is it about Missouri that yeah, makes it so hard to stay atop of? Well, if you think about it, um, I got running this race as a Democrat in Missouri. It's very has been very Republican lately. So not only do I have to excite the base and get them out, but I also have to make sure that people understand that I'm not ashamed to be a moderate. So it's a little bit like walking, chewing gum at the same time and juggling all at once to make everything work, um, to make sure people understand that my moderation is principled, but I'm not afraid to compromise, which um, I think a lot of Missouri voters like that I'm independent. I don't always vote the party line. Uh, so it, but it, it's tough. This is, this is a tough state in terms of it will never be completely red or completely blue, but it's pretty close to red these days. Uh, Senator Gene Robinson, uh, the president had that big rally out in your state. What, what impact do you think that had? Did it, uh, was it positive or negative for you? 
Oh, listen, he was here so often, I, I figure he was building a golf course, right? <laughs> um, he, he was here time after time after time. And then, of course, he finished the campaign here uh, with Rush Limbaugh and Sean Hannity and, and, and Jean Perot and, and Kellyanne Conway. They were, it was uh, a cast uh, down in Cape Girardeau last night. Uh, so clearly they want this state and they've worked very hard to do it. I do think it's a double-edged sword because while it motivates the Trump base when he's here, it also motivated a lot of people in my base uh, that really are not happy with President Trump. So I don't think we'll know whether or not ultimately it worked uh, or not until every vote is counted tonight. Senator McCaskill, um, as a woman in the Senate and as a woman leader in Missouri, uh, who's had a lot of different positions of authority uh, in your state and now in the country, I have to ask you how you feel like um, how you feel like gender plays right now in terms of being a senior elected woman um, at a play at a time when gender politics in our country right now and uh, the fight over sexism and sexual harassment and sexual assault and accountability and all of those things uh, is just is red hot and such a volatile issue. Um, obviously, we're seeing a record number of women running this year, particularly on the Democratic side. Uh, but I just wanted your perspective on that right now, especially uh, right now, not knowing how tonight's going to end for you. Well, I, I think it, um, it, it, these, th it's always going to be an issue that's out there. Sometimes it's more subliminal. Sometimes it's front and center. It's probably been a little more front and center this time. But I got to tell you honestly, Rachel, I think the biggest problem for me is not as much gender as it is that in politics today, it's really a mark against you if you know what you're doing. Um, <laughs> you know, experience, this is one of the few fields where experience is considered a negative. Um, right now. I mean, you know, in most careers, if you've done a lot of different things and learned a lot, then that is a positive thing. But right now, people really um, don't get excited about folks who have spent their life in public service. They want something new. Um, and so I think the fact that I have served the public so long, um, and maybe that's one of the things that's hurting Bill Nelson. I think if you've been serving the public for a long time, it, that's a difficult hurdle to get over these days. Senator Claire McCaskill tonight awaiting news of her own fate with her own voters in Missouri. Uh, good luck to you, Senator. Thank you for taking some time to be with us while you're still watching those vote totals uh, come in. We're looking forward to seeing how this turns out tonight. Thank you. The senator mentioned something new. Uh, I'm looking at Steve Kornacki, who is deep in the heart of Texas, speaking of something new. Steve. Something new, something blue. Yeah, in Texas, this is very similar to Florida in that you've got a ton of early vote. That early vote gets sort of uh, put out there almost all at once. Then you wait for the same day. And the question that hangs over the same day is, is there going to be a trend on the final day that's at odds with what you see in the early vote? So, uh, again, this looks like about, we think, about half the vote that's going to be cast total statewide. Wide, but when you start to go into these individual counties, what you'll see here, this will be a good example. A ton of vote here. It's going to say 1% of precincts. That's the giveaway that we are looking at early vote right here. So again, here's the comparison as we can show you how the early vote is looking for Beto O'Rourke. In 2016, Donald Trump won the state of Texas by nine points. So you basically got to improve the margin if you're a Democrat by nine points or more uh, across the state. So use that as a rough benchmark and we can compare. This is Dallas. In 2016, the margin here for Clinton was 26. Tonight, the margin in the early vote, 33, a seven-point improvement. Go next door to Tarrant County. The margin for Trump was nine. The margin for Trump right now, one in the early vote. That's down by eight. You go up to Denton, 21 has been cut to 10. That's 11 points. So you're seeing this in the Dallas area pretty consistently. 17 sits at seven, 10-point improvement. Where you're seeing a little bit better than that in the early vote for Democrats, take a look here. Travis County, this is Austin, 39 goes to 53. You talked about an explosion of Democratic energy, especially in the early vote. It speaks to that. Go north of uh, Austin, Williamson, 10, uh, a 10 point advantage there for Trump has turned into a three point advantage for O'Rourke. Here's an interesting one. We have yet to hear from Travis County, biggest in the state, Houston, but go to the suburbs outside of it. Clinton won this by seven. Ten. This is a little bit of a disappointment. Maybe it's only 10 right now in the early vote. But again, this is like Florida. We await that same day. All right, Steve Kornacki, thank you. And more on on this same topic, Chris Hayes has now made his way to O'Rourke headquarters in El Paso. And Chris, what are you uh, what are you hearing there? So I've been talking to a lot of strategists here in Texas, and 
There are a lot of uh, eyes wide open emoji right now because the numbers are different than people are used to seeing in statewide races. There's something interesting happening in terms of what's going to happen here. That, are, that Tarrant County is a, a good place to think about. That's a place that is the largest urban Republican district in the United States. It encompasses Fort Worth, Texas, right next to Dallas. That's a place where when the early vote came in, it was 50-50, as, as, as uh, Steve was just talking about. That's a number that puts Beto, Beto in, in the ballpark. Uh, so far, the, the kinds of early voting they're seeing, you're talking to Democratic strategists, particularly those who are running the state house races here. There's a bunch of state houses that have been targeted for Democrats. They're down in that state house, 95 to 55. And they got about 10 or 11 they're feeling pretty good about. Those are in Republican districts that they're looking like they may be able to flip. All of that points to an evening here in Texas as the votes come in that is more interesting than it's been in Texas for a very long time when you're looking at what kind of dynamics Beto would need in order to defeat the incumbent Ted Cruz. And ask, Chris, sorry. oh, I'm sorry. Brian, you go ahead. No, please. I'm sorry to interject. I was just going to ask kind of a dumb question, uh, which is, uh, Chris, I know that you've been through um, a lot of races like this. You've been through losing and winning races. You've been at headquarters uh, as the votes have come in. Just from your own reporting and your own sense, do you think that the Beto O'Rourke campaign believes that it will win tonight, or do they believe that they will lose tonight? They believe they will win. Now, that's a that's a crazy belief in some ways because of the history of statewide Democrats in Texas. Um, if you look behind me, and I don't know if you can see the shot, the setup here is not the setup of a person who is expecting to come out and give a desultory concession speech yeah. after losing by nine or 15 points, which is traditionally what happens to Democrats in the state of Texas running statewide. We are in a ballpark. There is a ton of media here. There is a huge venue behind us with bands. This is a campaign that I think went into today feeling they were in the ballpark literally and mm -hmm. figuratively of what they would need and if you're looking at you're looking at some of the democrat the republican strategists right now who know this state well particularly some of the big data people when they're looking at the modeling they're looking at a number of 8.2 million votes they're looking at what they're seeing in tarrant county particularly there's some real nervousness on the republican side right now and uh it's going to be an interesting night Chris Hayes, thank you. If you don't mind, we'd like to stay in touch because uh, we think you might be at one of the more exciting stories and storylines of the evening. Chris Hayes at O'Rourke headquarters in El Paso, Texas. Um, Nicole Wallace, I am thinking about the best laid plans in 2016, the <laughs> Javits Center on the west side of Manhattan. You know, I was thinking, listening to, to you and Chris Hayes, um, there's only so far science and polling and, and academics can take you. And so the people that sit in headquarters in front of computers with, you know, um, whirly hats on, they, they can only get you so far. They don't make you win or lose. Candidates make you win or lose. Candidates with magic make you win or lose. And candidates that are hated make you win or lose. Ted Cruz was supposed to win. Ted Cruz... Um, Really, to, to lose this after sort of crawling back to Donald Trump, who insulted his father and his wife, would be mm -hmm. a human tragedy, but an immense political victory. He is the most polarizing figure in the Republican Party, was famously at odds with the Bush family, the other famous Republican family to hail from Texas. But to see, to talk to Texans and to talk to Texas Republicans, as I have over the last three months, there are Beto signs in every corner of this state. There are Beto signs in Amarillo. There are Beto signs all over El Paso where he's from, but there are Beto signs in neighborhoods, in blocks, in streets that are known to be Republican strongholds. So it would not be surprising to see an upset there, and it would really... Really? You wouldn't be surprised to see an upset? Well, of even course, we would be surprised. Surprise. Surprise. But I wouldn't, <laughs> my point is, it wouldn't be surprising to Beto, because I think he is yeah. running as someone who, who he, he didn't have a pollster, he didn't do the conventional things, and he didn't become hostage to sort of the, the, the politics of, of red and blue, and it can't be mm -hmm. done, and you're running against Ted Cruz. There were, it, 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 would, it would be the story of the night if he were to win, but I'm, I'm betting he would do an interview and, and say to you, I'm not surprised I won. Whatever happens in Texas is, is technically going to be a surprise because if they usually get 4 million votes in, in a midterm election and they're going to get 8, 8 million, million or 9 something million like yeah. that this time, it's all a surprise. Nobody knows what that extra vote is going to be. And if in 2020 Texas turns out 8 or 9 million mm -hmm votes as their baseline from which they build mm -hmm. on a presidential year, yeah. I mean, that changes Texas if and Texas the country. Texas becomes a battleground state, well, it changes yeah. the country. I mean, yeah. We had one yeah. asset that I caught, <laughs> I can't believe it was a week ago, we had the Hardball College Tour down there um, at the University of Houston. I have never seen, well, Bill Clinton might be the best retailer I've ever seen. I mean, he works the last one in the room, he stays till everybody's gone, he wants to shake hands with everybody, chat up everybody. This guy's that good. 
He has none of the other problems. This guy has all the good stuff. So I think not having a pollster, I mean, Joe Kennedy, his best buddy in the house, said, I can't, I told him for a year, please get a pollster. <laughs> Don't dive in the pool until you know how deep it is or how cold it is. And he wanted to do it. Yeah. No one will have a pollster again if he wins with that one. Right. <laughs> we know for sure, 8.52 p.m. East Coast time. Another break. A quick one. We're back right after this. We've got a bunch of new poll closings coming up in just a couple of minutes at 9 o'clock at the top of the hour. Before that, quickly, we've got some more calls in House races. And Steve's going to tell us about the overall estimate of how the House is going to go. Steve Karnacki. Yeah, we've had a Kentucky 6. We've had our eye on this one all night. We've now officially made a projection here. Andy Barr, the Republican incumbent, is going to hang on in this district, holding off Amy. Mag hey, holding Steve, off Amy I have to interrupt yeah. you. Uh, Indiana Senate, Republican pickup. Donnelly has been turned away. This has just come into us. Mike Braun, Donald Trump worked hard to flip this seat from the Democrats. We are estimating that when all the votes are counted, this will be a GOP pickup in the Senate. Steve Kornacki, back to you. Yeah, the other big piece of news we have from you comes from our decision desk that has been watching these early House results, seeing Democrats get what they needed to out of Virginia 10. Again, they hit the level they expected. Florida 27 went as expected. Again, they don't, they need to get only a, a share of these, only about a third of these to get the House. So to lose these is not necessarily bad for Democrats. The question in a lot of cases here is, are they improving over Hillary Clinton's performance uh, significantly? You saw that in Kentucky 6. What that means is our decision desk is looking at the totality of this, sort of extrapolating out the trends and numbers they're seeing to similar districts around the country and coming up with their initial estimate of the night, which I can now show you. Their initial estimate is that Democrats will end the night with 224 seats plus or minus eight. So keep that in mind. 224 wow. minus eight would get you to 216. 216 would be short of the 218 needed for a majority. 224 plus eight would get you to 232 comfortably over what you need for a majority. And what that means is if you look at that range, where that number falls in it, we think it's about right now a 65% chance, about a two-thirds chance that when all these districts come in, if these trends hold, about a two-thirds chance that Democrats will end up in control at the end of the night. So again, we're going to see more of these districts start to come in, more of these individual counties in precincts. That number is going to change. I'll tell you now, it might change frequently, but use that that is the benchmark. The first estimate of the night comes in with Democrats a range of 216 on the low end to 232 on the high end and a two-thirds chance at this moment, we think, that they will end up in control of the House. And again, on the low end of that estimate, Steve, which is 216, that is not enough to make Nancy Pelosi speaker. That would leave, presumably, Kevin McCarthy a speaker. That's right. At this point, we've just got a call just ahead. We're waiting for poll closings at 9, but we have a new call right now. This is the West Virginia Senate race. Uh, NBC News can project that Democrat Joe Manchin will hold on to his seat in West Virginia. This was obviously a state that Trump won by huge double digits in 2016. That made Republicans very excited about the prospect of knocking off Joe Manchin. Joe Manchin is a home state senator above all else. He is a moderate Democrat, much in the in, in in the mold of Claire McCaskill, who's fighting for her seat tonight in Missouri. But Joe Manchin will be returning back to the Senate, and that will make the Democrats happy, especially given that just moments ago, it looks like they have lost Joe Donnelly's seat out of Indiana.